phone, Michael, and get the yeah, Excellent. Just, just. Yeah. Learn cars. We've, we've lost one. Good. Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. I would ask everyone in the room at this point, as I usually do, to turn off, uh, turn off mobile phones uh, as they can often interfere with the meeting and indeed the sound system. Uh, you'll also notice, um, for those pay paying attention, that um, some of the committee and officials are using tablet devices and this is instead of uh, hard copies of our papers. The first item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation, and we have five affirmative instruments before us. As usual, with affirmative instruments, we will have an evidence-taking session uh, with the Cabinet Secretary and his officials uh, on that instrument. And once we have had all of our questions answered, we'll have the formal debate on the motion. Can I now welcome um, the Cabinet Secretary and his officials, Alec Neil, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing. Welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Alison Taylor, Team Leader. Uh, John Patterson, Divisional Solicitor. Francis Conlon, Bill Team Leader. And Claire McKinley, Solicitor, Solicitor Scottish Government. Welcome to you all this morning. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make a brief statement to the committee? Yes, please, Convener. Thank, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to do so and to bring forward these affirmative instruments supporting the public body's Joint Working Scotland Act to the committee for discussion today. I will say a few words about the important role this legislation has to play in helping to ensure Scotland is a country that provides the very best support to its people wherever they may live and however complex their support needs. Health and social care systems around the world are adapting to meet the needs of populations that are living longer lives. Scotland is no different to the rest of the developed world in this regard. Nevertheless, our partners across Europe and beyond recognise that Scotland is taking bold and ambitious steps to integrate care. Our legislative framework for integration, of which these instruments are an important part, requires our health and social care systems to work together more closely than ever before. It places individuals, patients, service users, carers and families at the centre of planning and service provision, with outcomes set out in law and resources pooled to reflect and maximise support for the individual's whole pathway of care. This programme of reform builds on a long history of partnership working across health and social care in Scotland. Its development has benefited very greatly from the active involvement of a very wide range of stakeholders and partners across all sectors. I extend my sincere thanks to all of those people and organisations and look forward to continuing this work with them once the legislation is in place. I will now set out briefly the effect of the five affirmative instruments under your consideration today. The regulations on the integration scheme set out matters that must be included within the integration scheme that will be prepared by each local authority and health board in addition to matters already prescribed in the Act for inclusion in the scheme. This information provides a framework within which the Integration Authority, either an Integration Joint Board or Lead Agency, will operate. The regulations and outcomes for health and well-being set out the outcomes that every Integration Authority must work towards, providing a strategic framework for the planning and delivery of health and social care services. Together, these outcomes articulate the core values of the integrated health and social care system we are establishing in every part of Scotland. The regulations on prescribed health board functions set out which health functions and services may, must and must not be integrated. I would suggest that the most important aspect of these regulations is the list of health services that must be integrated as set out in Schedule 3. Health services are included on the must list to ensure that integrated arrangements include at least adult primary and community health care and aspects of adult hospital care that offer the best opportunities for service redesign and better outcomes. This is the approach we've set out from the beginning of this process through consultation and the passage of the bill itself through Parliament. 
the regulations on prescribed local authority functions set out which social care functions of local authorities must be integrated along with the health functions to which I referred. Finally, the modifications order included for your consideration makes technical amendments to the Act for two purposes. The amendments made by this order will ensure that the application of Section 14D of the Act is aligned with the policy intention where the lead agency model of integration is used. It also amends a cross-reference to the National Health Service Scotland 1978 Act to ensure that the powers of the Common Services Agency are appropriately broad. I welcome this opportunity to discuss these instruments further and thank you again, convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Do I have any questions for the Cabinet Secretary from members of the committee? Richard Simpson. Yes. Richard the, um, I think it's all been made very clear on the whole. The only area that I'm still slightly uh, concerned about is the um, continuing care. Uh, because with the report coming out last April and the proposal that the all continuing care should only be provided within a hospital setting, this seems to go against the general thrust of what uh, the government is trying to achieve, which is that people should be um, in as close to a home situation as possible and that care homes, certainly some of them, and not all of them, a few of them, are capable of looking after people with quite complex high needs and yet that report indicated that the already very small numbers in Scotland uh, that are involved in this, which means free care, um, you know, will actually be looked after in hospital. Just to quote the figures in England, there are 58,000 people who are receiving free NHS care, either in hospital or, uh, or in, in a care home, uh, and many of them are in a care home. In Scotland, that figure is only about 1,700 and I understand 1,100 or so are in hospital. There are still there are 600 in care homes. But proportionately, we should be seeing about 4,500 receiving conti free continuing NHS care, and we're not seeing that. So there, are, you know, comparisons with England are something I'm not really interested in, actually, frankly. It's what we do here that's critical. But I, I am just concerned that they, as far as my reading of these regulations, and they are technical and complex, as far as I can see. Uh, this issue has not been resolved, partly because I think the government haven't decided quite how to act on that report yet, as far as I know. I mean, they, they've accepted the report, but the action on it hasn't been agreed. So, you know, it seems to me to be an area of almost immediate dispute that if, if there are going to be 500 patients transferred or the new cohort of those potential 500 patients transferred, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, um, something of a problem. Can I say, Convener, I made a statement to Parliament following the report, accepting the recommendations in principle and outlining the way the Government is moving forward and I'm intending at some stage early in 2015 to bring a progress report to the Committee. I think the important key difference in that report recommended is that from April next year, that the continuing care the definition of continuing care would be that it's hospital-based. Uh, in other words, we're not saying there's a whole load of people with continuing care under the new definition, uh, and they're all going to be hospital-based. What we're saying is to be defined as continuing care for the future, it has to be people who require long stays in hospital, which, of course, under the new system will be reviewed uh, at least every three months in every case. Uh, so... The, f the fact of life is, in terms of integration, the care of those people will still come in uh, within the gambit of the relevant parts of this legislation, although obviously the day-to-day -day administration of their care will be under uh, the clinicians who are caring for them. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to say that. So th there should be no dispute whatsoever, and these people are part and parcel of what of this the joint legislation operation. does. Absolutely. Right. But I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. That's absolutely correct, and the uh, specialties within which they may be treated will either be part of the integrated arrangement or not, depending on the details set out in these regulations. So the focus is on what type of care and what locus of care is best for the patient, and that's a medical decision. Right, so uh, the thing is that uh, clearly that funding that will fall on the individual families if they're moved out of hospital. Well, as you know, we're uh, with COSLA no. reviewing uh, the whole issue of funding. For example, if you take dementia, for example, I know that's not continuing care, but it's a very similar kind, kind of situation, and we are reviewing the... the when, when free personal care was introduced, 
The reason why it was confined to people over pension age was because they no longer qualified for working age benefits. And the assumption was made that anyone who required the kind of care, say for dementia specifically, is an issue that's very topical at the moment, for, because out of the 87,000 people with dementia, diagnosed with dementia in Scotland, something of the order of 3,000 are under pension age. And there's a big issue then, what kind of care do they get? Now, some, some patients will be entitled anyway to free personal care because it's not only, uh, and some people misinterpret the legislation, that you've got to be over 65 to get it. There are exceptions to that. But the, I think the problem at the moment is because of the changes that have taken place to working age benefits, that there are people being caught who are under pension age but not qualifying for pre-personal care but not getting certainly the level of working age benefits that had been assumed they would get when free personal care was introduced. And, and that's part of this mix. And we are looking very actively at those people in relation to continuing care, as well as things like dementia, who fall between the stools to try and make sure we identify how many people it is, what circumstances under which do they fall between the stools and what do we need to do to close any gaps. And that's due to report by the end of the calendar year. I look forward to that. Richard Lyle. Thank you. Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, previously, I've said I welcome the bill and I welcome joint working. Previously, I had experience where um, the, the people in hospital weren't getting out because of social work, uh, hadn't adapted their homes, etc. And uh, basically, I'm sure this will help many people and uh, the people of Scotland. And I know you're totally committed to this bill. Um, but a question I want to ask you is in regards to proportional representation within the boards. Um, that many, uh, and you, you want to be inclusive as, as much as possible, but there is a situation, I believe, that uh, some political parties are taking all the representation on the board. Uh, I'm not going to name a particular party in my own area, but uh, um, I believe that's wrong, that we had from 2007-12, we had joint working with everyone and we were getting proportional representation on all, all, everything. All parties were getting a fair share. Um, I don't think that's happening in regards to this. Is there a view um, at some point to come back later on with other uh, subordinate legislation to fix this out? Or is it basically uh, the plea that I'm making for everyone to uh, basically share out um, and to ensure that everyone is represented on these boards? Well, I personally believe there is a strong case for local authority representation to be based on the proportionality of representation in the council. But the reason we haven't made that statutory is because it does introduce, if we introduce it to this legislation, it introduces a new principle in terms of the governance uh, of local authority, external representation to local authorities. So there is a wider debate to be had. So rather than prejudice or prejudge that debate, we're not making that a mandatory part of the representation, and we have no plans at the present to do so. Uh, although my own personal view is but for the stability of an integrated scheme, I, I think it should be, uh, it would be beneficial to have proportional representation, uh, certainly cross-party representation on uh, the board from the local authority representation, because I think we're all agreed this is about everybody working together, parking politics at the door and doing what's best for the service users and for patients. And I think you'll get more stability in the system if you try and widen the stakeholders, and, and that includes minority parties in councils, if you include them in the representation. But that's entirely a matter for each individual council to take a decision on, and it's not a mandatory uh, at all. As I say, I think there's a wider debate to be had uh, in terms of the future of local authorities, whether the principle of proportional representation should be extended to all bodies that the local authority has external representation on. And I think that's a wider debate that's out with the scope of this legislation. Uh, I recently attended a, a, an event where the, by the, for the BMA, uh, and that was one of the points they were also making. Are you also encouraging boards to ensure that there is a, 
representation from GPs, etc., on the board? Uh, absolutely, in three different ways. It's not just the partnership board that's important, it's also the makeup of the localities, which are absolutely fundamental to the working and success of this legislation. But also, even at this stage, in drawing up the shadow boards, drawing up the strategic plans, we have made it absolutely clear that, as well as looking at the substance of the strategic plans, we'll be looking at the process by which they drew up the strategic plans. And I want to be absolutely sure that all the key stakeholders, including GPs, because they've got a vital role to play in this, as many others have, but they are absolutely vital to the success of integration. And I want to be absolutely sure that all the key stakeholders have had an opportunity to be involved and contribute to the development of the strategic plan and do so on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Kinnear. Any other questions from committee members? No other questions, then I'll move now to agenda item number two, uh, which is the formal debate on the affirmative SSI, on which we've just taken evidence. At this point, um, can I remind the committee and others that um, they should not now put questions to the Cabinet Secretary. We are in uh, um, a, a debate, um, a formal debate, and of course, in that, in that sense, officials uh, must not speak in the debates. Uh, can I now then invite uh, Cabinet Secretary to move motion S4M11455. Formally move, convener. Thank you. Uh, do any members wish to contribute to the debate? I have no bids. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I presume you will not feel the need to sum up. No, thank you, sir. Uh, I therefore put the question that motion S4M11455 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We now move then to agenda item number three, our second formal debate on the, the affirmative SSI, which we have just taken evidence, and invite uh, Minister to move motion S4M11456. Formally move, convener. Thank you. Um, I offer the members an opportunity to contribute to the debate. Yes, Richard. Just briefly, I think that the important thing is that the uh, clarity with which this uh, SSI divides contractual arrangements from operational arrangements, and I think that that's extremely welcome, because I think that was one of the things in which the previous attempts to provide integration on a, or drive integration on a voluntary basis failed. So I welcome the fact that this does make clear that the board retains the responsibility for the contractual arrangements on a whole list of issues, but that the function of it will actually go to the to the new joint board and that, that they will have the power to do the planning and actually affect the operation of the system. So I just wanted to say that I welcome this. I Thanks, Richard. Are, are there any other members who wish to contribute to the debate? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to sum up? No, I agree respond? with uh, Dr Simpson. I think this is an important element in the uh, making this uh, a success. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now put the question that motion S4M11456 be approved. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, thank you. Agenda item number four, uh, which is our third formal debate on the affirmative SSIs, which we have just taken. And can I invite the Minister to move motion S4M11457? Formally move, convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I offer the, the committee members an opportunity to participate in the debate. Make comment? No. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I don't presume there is any need for no, you thank to you. Uh, sum up. And we, uh, I therefore put the question that motion S4M11457 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Um, agenda item number five, um, our fourth formal debate in the affirmative SSIs, which we have just taken. Uh, can I invite the Minister to move the motion S4M11458? Formally move, convener. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, do any members wish to participate in the debate? No. No. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I therefore put the question that motion S4M11458 be approved. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Agenda item number six, our fifth and, and final formal debate today. I, um, can uh, we invite the Minister to move motion S4M11459? Formally move, convener. Thank you. Any members wishing to participate in the debate? 
no. Forgo your opportunity Forgo that summer. as well, convenient. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I therefore put the question that motion S4M11459 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, our consideration of subordinate legislation. Thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for his uh, time uh, formally and informally this morning and for the attendance of your colleagues. Thank you all very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we suspend at this point while we wait on the Minister, I think, to begin the... Yep, you have. We now move to agenda item number uh, seven, stage two, consideration of the Good Food Scotland Bill. Uh, and members uh, should have a, a copy of the groupings and the Marshall list. Uh, can I welcome the Minister for Public Health, M Michael Matheson, and his officials here with us this morning. Welcome to you all. Uh, we move directly to the the... The question is that sections one and two be agreed. Uh, are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, can I call amendment 49 in the name of uh, Aileen McLeod, group with amendments 51, 52, 56, 58, 62 and 64. Aileen McLeod to move amendment 49 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Now, the majority of the amendments I'm uh, bringing forward this morning at uh, Stage 2 of the Food Scotland Bill for the Committee's consideration are based on concerns that were raised uh, with me by a number of groups, uh, not least those with a particular interest in consumer protection and consumer uh, interests, and we're obviously keen to see the role of Food Standards Scotland in relation to consumers uh, strengthened, and some of these I think are worth exploring further with the Minister, and others I'm obviously just keen to seek some reassurance uh, from the Minister. Now, these groups are broadly uh, supportive of the provisions of the Food Scotland Bill itself, 
and they see the bill as affording a real opportunity for the new Food Scotland body to build on the strengths of the Food Standards Agency Scotland. Now, many of the amendments in this grouping, that's amendments 49, 51, 52, 56, 58, 62 and 64, are primarily seeking to ensure that the new food body does deliver for consumers by protecting the public from risks to health, improving the diet of the public and that the interests of consumers are very much uh, protected and central to everything that it does in relation to food. So if I look at Amendment 49, Section 3, General Functions, um, page 2, line 7, and that's paragraph C, where it's looking at the removal of the word uh, significantly. I think the thinking behind that is that by only requiring the body, the new body to act when matters significantly affect consumers' capacity to make informed decisions about food matters, that this threshold to inform consumers is perhaps set too low and this amendment would in effect try to widen the range of food matters to which the FSS is to keep the public informed about and advised. Amendment 51, convener, it inserts a new provision into section 4 which concerns issues around governance and uh, accountability and that requiring Food Standards Scotland to operate in a way which treats the interests of consumers as its primary um, consideration. Uh, Amendment 52, still within the section 4 on governance and accountability of the FSS, seeks to amend the definition of good decision-making practice by providing that it includes consulting consumers and representatives uh, of consumers. Amendments 56 and 58 seek to amend section 6 of the bill around issues of the membership and appointment of members of the FSS by ministers. And the concerns here seem to be largely around ensuring that there is a, an open process that secures a balance of expertise and how we actually get a balance between those on the board that are with an industry experience and those who have experience uh, or knowledge of consumer affairs. Amendment 58 is related to Amendment 56. But it goes a little further in that it asks that when ministers are appointing members of the FSS that they have regard to the balance of expertise, skills and experience required by members to ensure that Food Standards Scotland operates in a way which treats the interests of consumers as its primary consideration. Uh, the last amendment in this grouping convener, Amendment 64, which seeks to amend the meaning of other interests of consumers in relation to food in section 54 by providing that that definition is widened to include wider social and ethical considerations relevant to food. The concern here seems to have been around that the proposed definition was perhaps too narrow and that the focus is largely on uh, labelling issues and food descriptions. But again, I think it may be that what is necessary is just some reassurance around this that the FSS will have sufficient scope to represent the public on all food issues that matter to them and that this is perhaps made uh, a bit uh, clearer. So I would certainly welcome some comments from the Minister around those amendments in Group 1. Can you move Amendment 49? Uh, sorry, I, um, I move the amendments. Uh, 49, 51, uh, 52, 56, 49, 50, fine. Okay. Yeah, fine. Um, no other members? No other members, Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I will respond to each of the amendments that Ailey McLeod has brought forward. On Amendment uh, 49, uh, we understand the intention of uh, this proposal to remove uh, the word uh, significant. It's important that uh, Food Standards Scotland Act as a, as a wide, on a wide range of interests uh, that are important to consumers, uh, and that's what its intended objective is. Uh, however, the practical effect uh, of this seemingly small change would mean that the body could have to turn its attention to a wide range of concerns, uh, significant or not. This could risk it losing focus on the most important matters that it has to give consideration to. I believe that the word significant uh, is important here uh, to make clear that although Food Standards Scotland will be concerned with all matters of interest to uh, consumers, it cannot lose focus on those matters which have the most impact on consumers. Uh, and for that reason, I would invite the committee not to support Amendment 49. On Amendment uh, 51, uh, I appreciate the intention behind this particular amendment, uh, as it will be important that the message is clear from Food Standards Scotland uh, that it must be consumer-focused. Uh, but I uh, would argue that this particular amendment is unnecessary. 
It's already clear uh, from Section 2 of the Bill, uh, setting out the objectives of Food Standards Scotland, that the interests of the consumer have to be its primary concern. To set this out in different language again in Section 4, I believe is unnecessary and could be uh, potentially confusing. Uh, I believe uh, that the objectives of Food Standards Scotland are already set out clearly in the Bill, and I would therefore invite the Committee uh, not to support Amendment 51. Amendment 52 uh, would require Food Standards Scotland to consult consumers and their representatives. Uh, consultation will be a key, a key issue for the new uh, body. Under European legislation, we have to consult publicly on all food law. Uh, the bill goes further and requires Food Standards Scotland to consult all those affected by its decisions. It will be a consumer-focused body, and that means that consumers and their representatives will be consulted. I therefore do not believe uh, that it's necessary to state this again in the bill. Indeed, the wording of Amendment 52 is also problematic in that it does not require consultation before any decision or action, and so may not fully deliver its intention. The existing provisions in the Bill require consultation before any action. And for that reason, I would ask the Committee not to support Amendment 52. On Amendment 56, I'd like to send the strongest signal that it is hard to imagine a circumstance where anyone without experience or knowledge of consumers could be suitable for appointment to the Board of Food Standards Scotland. Given that the objective of the body uh, are entirely focused uh, on the public and consumer, uh, I therefore believe that that's a requirement for any member uh, who may be appointed to uh, the board. I realise that the amendment uh, does not intend to limit the influence of uh, consumer focus, but by introducing the notion that only two members uh, must have this experience or skill, uh, this amendment may dilute the need uh, for this experience in all members. So I hope uh, the committee will agree that the amendment is unnecessary and I would invite the committee not to support this particular change. On amendment uh, 58, uh, this covers the same ground as amendment 56. Uh, the desire uh, to make this a requirement by amending the bill is understandable. But as I said before, uh, ministers do not intend to appoint members without experience of consumers or consumers affairs. Uh, the skills required uh, of members uh, must be linked to uh, the Food Standards Scotland's objectives, which are all about consumer focus. As with Amendment uh, 56, uh, this amendment is not necessary, uh, and so again I would invite the committee not to support it. Similarly with the Amendment uh, 62, uh, any committees established by Food Standards Scotland would be bound by its consumer interest focus. Under the terms of the Bill, as it stands, it should not be possible for committees to operate out with the scope of uh, protecting the public and the interests of consumers. I suggest that this amendment is therefore uh, unnecessary, and I would invite the committee not to support Amendment 62. Amendment uh, 64 uh, introduces some very specific meaning to other interests of consumers. I recognise that social and ethical considerations will naturally form part of the interests of uh, consumers. However, these particular interests uh, would uh, be covered already by existing provisions. I would uh, argue that being as specific as the amendment suggests may lead consumers to question why only these interests are listed as examples. Uh, this uh, could lead to a misunderstanding about the wider consuming, consumer objectives of Food Standards Scotland. And for this reason, I think this amendment uh, would not be helpful uh, as uh, is intended, uh, and I would invite the committee not to support it. Thanks, Minister. Ailey McLeod uh, Mag to wind up the uh, oh. press of withdrawal. What, sorry? I'm you, not having a debate. No, you can if you yes. make a bid. Yes. I think it's, it's, I'm sure it was. Uh -huh. I've got that mixed up. But, well, I've not got that mixed up. I, I offered people the opportunity to participate in the day before I called on the Minister to, to respond and wind up. So I'm sorry about that. 
Aileen McGlynn. Uh, thank you, Camille. I've, um, well, I've listened um, carefully to what the Minister has had to say around these amendments um, concerning the representation of consumer interests, and I you know, am reassured by what the Minister has, uh, has said this morning, so I will not be um, pressing these amendments at this stage. Withdrawn. It's withdrawn. Richard Simpson? I wish to move the amendments. If a member withdraws, I understand that another member may move the amendment if they, if, uh, they wish to do to so. Get the members agreement that the, 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 we need to get the members' agreement, as I understand it, that, that the amendment would be withdrawn rather than moving it again. It's already been moved. Yes. So the member who moved it may withdraw it, but nobody else may move that one because it's been moved once. So if the member doesn't move subsequently on other amendments, another member can move that, but not in the case of one that's been moved and then withdrawn. Well, I'm, be, I'm, be, I'm being told in this, in this instance that, that it's been moved and withdrawn and no other, mem no other member can move that. Well, I, I, want, convener, I want to put on record my dissatisfaction with the way this procedure is being handled today. I, I did not hear the offer for speakers because I would have immediately come in and uh, I've been, I feel I've been denied the opportunity of making a number of points about this, well, I, uh, I, I, which I think were important and the committee uh, should take into consideration before uh, this happens. Also, I, I express my dissatisfaction with the fact that the moving member can withdraw without the, without the committee actually having an opportunity to say whether the committee agrees to that being withdrawn or not. That is not my understanding of the procedure. That that, that's, that's a difference between what I said and what the advice I had, you can object to the motion being, the amendment being withdrawn, but you can't move the amendment. Ah, right. Well, I object I, to, and, I object uh, to you it know, being and withdrawn. I should, I should point out that there was, before I went to the Minister, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll take the criticism that I went to the Minister too quickly, but I had no bids from any member to participate in the debate. You know, I, think, the, I think my dispute class. is that, that you, are, you didn't ask the minister to wind up. You asked the minister to, to speak. And, then, well, and therefore, I understood it was his introductory remarks about it and that we weren't at the well, winding up stage. I'm, so sorry, I think, I'm sorry for that misunderstanding. But I, you know, I, right. you know, well, I, I want to object to the uh, being withdrawn, if that's permitted. It is indeed. Does the committee agree to the do, member withdrawing? Do the committee agree to the member withdrawing? No. Okay. So, yeah. the committee do not agree. Uh, the committee agree that the with the member that the amendment should be withdrawn. And is there a vote being recorded those on that? Those who agree to indicate. Well, we take a vote. Yep. Those committee members who agree the amendment should be withdrawn, please show. One, two, three, four. Six. Those against the amendment being withdrawn. Two and one abstention. Okay. So okay. We now move um, to call amendment 50 in the name of Aileen McLeod and a group on its own. Aileen McLeod to move and speak to the amendment. And then, of course, any other members who wish to participate in the debate before I go to the Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, with Amendment 50, um, in Section 3, page 2, line 12, um, Section 3 it currently provides that the new FSS body has the function of monitoring the performance of enforcement authorities in enforcing food legislation. And the purpose of this amendment, as I say, in Section 3, page 2, line 12, um, but I seek to add in and promote best practice by. The purpose of that amendment is to try and expand the FSS function in relation to the enforcement authorities so that in addition to monitoring their performance, the new body must also uh, promote best practice by enforcement authorities. At the moment, the bill doesn't require the FSS to promote best practice between local authorities and other agencies despite the new body being in a key position to do so. And I think this would also help to put the relationship between the FSS and the local authorities onto a more proactive basis, which is generally felt this will lead to better outcomes around food safety and enforcement issues. Richard Simpson. Thank you very much, <laughs> convener. Um, can I speak in support of this particular motion? I think that it's, it's critical that the 
new food standards body should be in a position to promote a best practice. It is, it is essential to me that they look at a variation between local authorities and that they not only select uh, those that are perhaps not doing well and report back to us on the fact that that is not happening for whatever reason, but they should also be able to pick up best practice and be able to promote that within the different local authorities who are the main enforcement body. So I very much welcome this addition uh, uh, to the amendment and, and uh, would speak therefore in support of it. Thank you. Is there any other member? Annette. Wait to, to say that this is, is an important amendment, I think, because it, clearly best practice has, has to be uh, sought across the country. And we know there are variations. Um, you know, everything's not the same in every authority. So I'd be happy to support this amendment as well. OK. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, on Amendment uh, 50, the creation of uh, Food Standards Scotland provides an opportunity to have a look at the links between enforcement nationally and locally. Uh, this is not something which we should rush into and is already part of our vision of how we uh, provide even better protection for uh, the public and consumers in going forward. However, uh, first of all, we must make sure that we bed in Food Standards Scotland. Uh, this amendment, uh, I believe, uh, will help to provide a strategic link between enforcement authorities and Food Standards Scotland, uh, which is why I support this particular amendment, and I would invite the committee uh, to support this amendment for the reasons that were outlined by Aileen MacLeod. Uh, Aileen MacLeod, to wind up, press or withdraw. Um, I would like to um, press the amendment, and uh, can I um, thank the Minister uh, for his support to this amendment. Okay. Uh, the question is then that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is then that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Can I now call Amendment 51 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 49. Aileen McLeod to move or not move? Uh, not move. Not move. Not move. Mm -hmm. uh, does any member object to the, 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 um, the amendment? Yes. Being withdrawn. So, you have to put the question there. so I put the question that the committee agree that the amendment 49 in the name of Ailey McLeod sh should not be withdrawn. No. 51. Sorry. Already debated in 49. It's not, not withdrawn, it's just that Richard's moving it. So that's fine. So you just need to put the question on the amendment right. now. So he can move this one because it hasn't been moved previously. Right. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. So Richard Simpson. I move the amendment 51. Yes. Right. Can I have a show of hands then? Right. On, the, on the question that amendment 51 be agreed to, are we all agreed? No. No, we are not. We now move to a division. Behind the with all that technology here with this paperwork rustling about. Those, uh, can I have a show of hands, please, for those in favour of Amendment 51? One, two, three. Uh, those um, uh, against? One, two, three, four, five. Abstention? One. For the amendment, we have three against the amendment, five abstentions, one is therefore not carried. Falls. The, then we move now to call amendment 52. In the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 49. Aileen McLeod, to move or not move? Um, not move. Richard Simpson. Nope. Moved. Okay. Moving. The question is then that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh. We are not. A division. Then uh, can I have a show of hands in favour of Amendment 52. Those against? One, two, three, four, five. Any abstentions? 
The amendment, therefore, is not agreed. Can we now call Amendment 53 in the name of Ailey McLeod, group with Amendment 54. Ailey McLeod to move Amendment 53 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, these two amendments, um, 53 and 54, are around there being a need to strengthen the provisions in Section 4 around governance and accountability. And this was to deal with some of the concerns that had been raised around um, ensuring that there were sufficient protections for how the new body will ensure that there is openness <coughs> and uh, transparency. Please join me in 10 minutes' time in the garden lobby, where all building users will be invited to observe two minutes' silence of remembrance for all those who have suffered and died in the service of the country and all those who mourn them. There will be a further announcement to indicate the start and end of the period of silence. Of course, um, the committee and minister and members of the public will be observing that period of silence here in the committee room. Can we please continue, uh, continue now, Aileen McLeod? Uh, thank you, convener. So the aim, ultimately, of both amendments 53 and 54 is for the new FS to hold its meetings in public except where the matter on discussion relates to personnel matters or it considers that other exceptional circumstances apply. Where meetings are held in private, then the reason for doing so must be made publicly uh, available. So Amendment 53 inserts the words, unless subsection 2A applies, holding all meetings of uh, Food Standards Scotland and all meetings of any committee established by in public into section 4, paragraph 2 of the bill. And Amendment 54 seeks to insert two new subsections, uh, 2A and 2B, into Section 4. And these are the new subsections which set out the circumstances under which Food Standards Scotland or any of its committees may decide to hold meetings or parts of meetings in private. Thank you. Move the amendments. Yeah, thank you. Richard Simpson. Yes, I want to speak in support of this amendment. I think that uh, most, most of the bodies and public bodies in Scotland now do hold their meetings in public, and that's a very welcome, uh, a welcome uh, um, uh, development. Um, but the, there have been a tendency to hold sections in private, and those sections have tended to extend uh, beyond the issues that are listed here. Uh, now, this gives a fairly broad remit to the Committee of the Food Standards to hold meetings in private where... Uh, they feel there are circumstances that should apply, but does require them to give reasons for that. So it means that the public can have confidence that they are not actually uh, discussing matters in private, which should more appropriately be discussed in public. Uh, so it allows uh, uh, public scrutiny, and indeed scrutiny by us as MSPs, of this process as it goes forward. So I very much welcome Aileen McLeod's moving um, amendments 53 and 54, Rhoda or 53 at the moment. Can I speak in support of those amendments as well? I think it's very important for the new board to be transparent so that people know what's going on and can have confidence in it. And I think as we kind of make decisions, I think it's in the public interest to have transparency on that. So I would welcome those amendments and indeed support them. Annette Mellon. Yes, I mean, we, we, we live in an era where, where it's becoming more and more important to have transparency in, in all public public bodies, and, and I think these amendments just indicate that the, the new agency <coughs> would follow that pattern. Thank you. Um, Minister? Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, we uh, consider that amendments uh, 53 and 54 are unnecessary. Uh, nothing in the bill uh, prevents Food Standards Scotland holding uh, meetings in public uh, and nothing prevents uh, publishing uh, papers. The bill is drafted, it uh, provides for a sufficient degree of accountability and transparency uh, and Food Standards Scotland is under a duty to keep the public informed uh, and to publish uh, reports. Uh, the actual effects of uh, the amendments are not wholly uh, clear. Uh, this is because the amendments do not place direct duties on Food Standards Scotland to hold meetings in public. Instead, the amendments are placed within the context of wider duties of Food Standards uh, Scotland to operate so far as is reasonably uh, practicable uh, in particular uh, circumstances. 
These are matters which we believe uh, can be dealt with administratively, uh, and as this is an advisory body uh, which is required by its general functions to keep the public informed and advised, uh, that we believe the approach uh, that has been set out in Amendments uh, 53 and 54 uh, is disproportionate, and I therefore invite the Committee not to support these amendments. Haley McLeod to wind up press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I think, in light of the Minister's comments, um, that the matters around the openness and transparency can be dealt with um, administratively. Um, and obviously these are important issues to obviously to give a reassurance to the public and also with consumers. But I'd be happy to um, withdraw those amendments, um, but also um, to perhaps reserve the right to, um, to revisit in terms of having a, an opportunity to actually go back and speak to the, to the groups concerned, to just to get some of the kind of feedback from Please themselves really around at stage three. In the garden lobby, where all building users will be invited to observe two minute silence of remembrance for all those who have suffered and died in the service of their country and all those who mourn them. There will be further announcements to indicate the start and end of the period of silence. Press or withdraw? Withdraw. I understand now the latest advice is that we just put the question if, if that... No, no one's objecting. No, the, nobody's objecting this time. Yes, but you need to... Sorry, I thought because it had been moved I wasn't allowed to. Well, the advice is that the, the, the question can be put. Not You can't move it again, but the, if you object to it, the question can be put. As to whether it should be withdrawn. Or yes, yes I, I object. On the amendment, Richard. Yeah, 53. The question is then that amendment 53 be agreed to or we all agreed... We're not agreed. Not we go to a division for the amendment. Four. Against the amendment. Five. The amendment falls. Call amendment 54 in the name of Ailey McLeod. Already debated with amendment 53. Ailey McLeod to move or not move? Um, not move. Move. Richard. Wish to move that motion. The question. the question then is that I mentioned uh, Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. We move to a division for the amendment. Please show. One, two, three, four. Against the amendment. Five. No abstentions. Uh, the, the, the amendment has not been agreed to. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. The question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Stop there, I think. I'm just looking for a, a point to stop now, and I think that might be the point that we can stop now and just wait until the notice for the silence, which will go in yeah. about three minutes or so, rather than be caught in the middle of that. And then, agreed. are we agreed? Suspend, yeah, agreed. Yeah. So we suspend at this point until after the... Thanks.
Are we okay? Yeah, we'll just yeah, cut the other instruments in case uh, there's any more. Can we now resume and call amendment 55 in the name of Ailey McLeod? Group with amendments 36, 37, 57, 59, 60, 61, 38, 39 and 40. Eileen McLeod to move Amendment 55 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, if I may, I will speak with Amendments uh, 55, um, 60, 57, 60 and 61. Amendment 55 says to take on board the concerns that a number of groups have raised with me regarding the minimum size of the FSS Board of three members and a chair, which, you know, from the concerns that were raised, uh, I think there was, these could be insufficient to ensure that there is a more appropriate balance of expertise amongst the members, and there was a preference was for increasing this to a minimum of five members and a chair. Now, I'm also conscious that at stage one, the Minister uh, told the committee that the new body will have a minimum of four, including the chair, and a maximum of eight members, and that the committee in its stage one report indicated that it wasn't convinced that the number number of members of the board um, needs to be uh, increased. I think the key point here is just around uh, reassurance from the Minister that there will be an appropriate balance of expertise between industry and consumer uh, representatives. Uh, amendment 57 relates back to amendments 56 and 58, again seeking greater transparency and openness around ministers making appointments to the FSS based on merit and ensuring there is a balance of expertise through an open appointment procedure. And then a convener, amendment 60 and 61 concern again the membership of the board and these are more seeking to explore uh, what might be possible around limiting appointments to a four-year period, renewable only once, so that there can be uh, fresh thinking of different people uh, with experience of new food uh, technology. And I think the intention here is very much about ensuring that the FSS remains at the forefront of new developments around food science and technology. Thank you. Dr Richard Simpson to speak to Amendment 36. Yes, well, amendments can, in the group. If I can first of all address 36, 37, 38 and 39, uh, I want to explore with the Minister the reasons for the councillor and employee of any local authority being excluded from the, from the, um, the, the, the board. Uh, I understand fully A, B, C and D in Section 6, uh, 2, uh, as excluding a, a group of people who are normally excluded. And I understand that normally councillors and employee uh, local authorities are excluded. However, because of this particular board and its relationship with the local authorities who will be acting as the enforcement agency, I believe that it should be possible, although not, not a requirement, that uh, a local authority or employee of the local authority who has great expertise in the enforcement should actually be a member of the board. And that This will be critical to what we've already passed, that's promoting best practice as well as monitoring the performance of the enforcement authorities. So I think in this particular instance, uh, as I say, I would like to explore with the minister whether it would not be more appropriate to remove that. This does not then require the board or the minister to appoint a councillor or an employee of the local authority, but the act as written would actually preclude the minister having that discretion should he or she choose to operate it. If I may speak in reference to the other parts of this, I think that the uh, Amendment 55 is an entirely appropriate one. Let us suppose that there are only three members appointed, though I think that's unlikely. One of them then becomes the chair. If one is from consumers and one is from industry, I think that you know we've got a, a significant problem. I think we also have a problem with quorate, because if one of them does not turn up, let us say the consumer person is unable to attend, you could end up with the chair and an industry member being represented on the board. This is an independent board, and it is therefore, in my view, critical, as was alluded to in the committee report, that a minimum of five should actually be uh, would be a more appropriate number. In terms of the term of service. I think the fact that people can serve for eight years is, is a, a reasonable length of time. And after that, uh, they, uh, they should, um, I think that we should be refreshing the board with, with, new, with new members. It may be that there requires to be further consideration as to whether this would apply to the chairman or the chairman appointed in a successive period. So there may be actually more detail to be done than that, and uh, that's something, again, that it would be interesting to hear the Minister's view on. I'm thinking of a situation where maybe 
six years in, for example, someone is then appointed as chairman, you wouldn't want them to drop off after another two years. So it may be that, that we need further, needs to be further work on, on, on looking at that. The last amendment is Amendment 40, and I appreciate that the six-month rule is in here in this particular section, that's Section 7 um, uh, um, uh, on page 4. Um, where the, uh, if they don't attend for a period of six months, then they, sh they should come out. Uh, I've been thinking about this and, and uh, thinking that actually it is possible that you could have a, a member having uh, treatment over a period of six months and you wouldn't necessarily want them to come off the board. So I'm not absolutely sure of that, but I've, I, haven't um, I haven't moved an amendment to suggest that that should be taken out. Uh, but I do think also that if members don't attend uh, for at least one third of the meetings held in any 12 month period, then this should be automatic, it should lead to automatically removed. Now, at the moment, it's, it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, the minister might wish to end someone's uh, membership, and the Section 272 deals with that um, uh, largely, but um, I think that, the, again, this is an independent board. So it may be that the board themselves, as opposed to the ministers, would actually want to with, with remove this, remove someone who doesn't attend on a regular basis for no good reason. Uh, and, and leaving that simply up to the minister may not be the most appropriate thing, but at the moment I've moved an amendment uh, to insert it in section 7.2.B.1. Thank you, Richard. Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I find uh, what... Uh, Richard Simpson was saying was quite interesting about, about councillors. Can I remind him there are over 1,200 councillors in Scotland? Uh, on a previous session, I was pushing the Cabinet Secretary in regard to membership for councillors on a particular board, but on this occasion, I can't uh, agree with his amendment and won't be supporting it. Now, move to the ministers. No, no other bids for participation. Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, as you're aware, the Health and Sport Committee has already considered the uh, number of members uh, and accepted that the number set out in the bill is the minimum only. Um, I uh, have given my assurance to the committee uh, that the intention will be to run Food Standards Scotland with a full complement um, of eight members. That's uh, seven members of the board and uh, the chair at most times. Uh, the number in the bill, uh, three members plus the chair, uh, has to be low enough to allow uh, a level of flexibility during reappointment rounds uh, or in the case of emergencies. It is the uh, same number or another similar size uh, bodies which we discussed at uh, stage uh, one. Uh, Richard Simpson made reference to the possibility of the consumer person not potentially being available uh, for a particular board meeting. And as I've uh, already advised the committee, uh, the, those who will be appointed to the board of Food Standards Scotland will all be required to have a consumer uh, focus given the responsibility of the body. Uh, therefore, uh, we don't believe uh, that uh, we should uh, reconsider uh, the numbers at this uh, stage. Amendment uh, 36 and 37, uh, removing councillors or uh, employees of any council from the list of uh, persons who cannot be appointed to Food Standards Scotland could be problematic and impractical. Under the Ethical Standards Code of Conduct for board members, councillors or council employees, if also members of Food Standards Scotland, would have to declare an interest and take no part in discussions or decision-making about matters concerning local authorities. Uh, that would diminish their ability to be fully active members and affect the body's ability to perform its duties uh, quite significantly. It's worth considering that almost half of the work which will be undertaken by uh, Food Standards Scotland will be around enforcement matters, the vast majority of which is undertaken by local authorities. I would therefore uh, invite the committee uh, to agree that it would be impractical uh, uh, to change uh, this provision within the bill and to invite you uh, not to support this amendment. Amendment uh, 57 is unnecessary as ministers are already under this duty to make appointments based on merit through open appointment procedures in respect of appointments to public bodies. Uh, this amendment duplicates existing practice 
uh, from the Public Bodies and Public Appointments Scotland Act 2003. The Parliament has appointed the Commissioner of, for Ethical Standards to oversee uh, compliance of this particular duty and therefore ask the Committee not to support Amendment 57 for this reason. With regards to Amendment 59, applications for public appointments are made in confidence. The main effect of Ministers publishing the details of all applicants is likely to be a reduction in the number of people who will be willing to apply. A reduction in applications is not something I'm sure uh, that the Committee would wish to see. Uh, Scottish Ministers already have a good account of the breadth of society uh, with which applications come uh, when considering further and future recruitment rounds. Uh, the requirement to publish applications is therefore not necessary to achieve that, and so I would ask the Committee not to support this amendment. On Amendments 60 and 61, on the period of appointment and on reappointment limits for members of Food Standards Scotland, in uh, another aspect of uh, public appointments uh, is another aspect of public appointments which is already covered. Uh, the Parliament's Commissioner for Ethical Standards oversees uh, Ministers' compliance with the Commissioner's Code on Appointments. This code recommends uh, an eight-year limit for appointments. Uh, so these amendments are unnecessary and, and contrary to the existing code, and I would therefore invite the Committee uh, not to support these amendments. Amendments uh, 38 and 39 are impractical uh, for the uh, same reasons as Amendments 36 and 37. If a member becomes a councillor of any local authority or a council employee, it would be impractical for the person to continue as a member of Food Standards Scotland. Under the Code of Conduct uh, for members, that person uh, would have to take no significant, uh, would have to take no part in a significant portion. Um, of Food Standards Scotland's uh, uh, body's uh, business. I should say to Richard Simpson um, that expertise uh, from local authorities can be provided to uh, the Board of Food Standards Scotland uh, through the secondment of uh, staff to the body as and when required, uh, but there would be a real potential conflict of interest if they were actually a formal member of the Board, and I therefore uh, ask the Committee not to support these amendments. With regards to Amendment 40, um, uh, we believe it is unnecessary. Uh, the Bill already provides sufficient grounds for the removal of a person uh, by reason of uh, absence, and there is level flexibility uh, which allows that to be extended uh, where, for example, in the situation that Richard Simpson referred to, uh, a member may be undergoing treatment, uh, and there would be flexibility to allow that period of absence to be extended. And I would therefore ask the Committee uh, not to support Amendment 40. Thank you, Minister. Ailey McLeod to wind up a press withdrawal. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think having uh, listened to the Minister's uh, comments, I, mean, I do feel sort of more reassured. Um, and I think that many of the issues that had been raised with me, particularly in the amendments uh, 55, 57, 60 and 61, I think have clearly been considered and, you know, and accept the Minister's reassurance that members on the FSS will have a consumer uh, focus. So I think at this stage um, I won't be pressing uh, these amendments. Well, therefore, so I... the member has sought to withdraw. Does anyone object? Yep. Do any members object to the withdrawal of Amendment 55? No objection. We now move to call Amendment 56 in the name of Ailey McLeod, already debated with Amendment 49. Aileen McLeod to move or not move? I am not move. Move. I therefore call Amendment 36 in the name of Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 55. Dr Richard Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Call Amendment 37 then in the name of uh, Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 55. Not moved. Uh, therefore, call Amendment 57 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 55. Aileen McLeod, to move or not move? Not move. I move to call Amendment 58 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 49. Aileen McLeod, to move or not move? 
Not moved. I therefore move to call Amendment 59 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 55. Dr Richard Simpson, do you move moved. or not move? Pardon? No. Not move. Not move, no. sorry. Uh, call Amendment 60 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 55. Aileen McLeod, to move or not move? Not moved. Therefore, call Amendment 61 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 55. Aileen McLeod, to move or not move? Not moved. Okay. Um, uh, the question is then that uh, section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Great. Thank you. Can I now call Amendment 38 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson? Already debated with Amendment 55. Not moved. Not moved. Uh, therefore, call Amendment 39 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson. Already debated with Amendment 55. Not moved. Not moved. For call amendment 40 in the name of uh, Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with amendment 55. Not moved. Uh, the question then is that section 7 uh, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, move now to section 11. Call amendment question that section... Oh, sorry. The question is then that sections 8 to 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Section 11, call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 2. Minister to move Amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, convener, uh, uh, Amendment uh, 2, which is the uh, main amendment here, is a minor change to the Bill uh, and is a common provision used when establishing public bodies. Uh, it clarifies the position uh, that anything done by Food Standards Scotland or any of its committees is not invalid uh, because of a defect in membership, including having a membership uh, ended because uh, Section 7 applies. Uh, this will ensure that decisions and actions uh, taken by Food Standards Scotland and its committees uh, are not open to challenge on the basis of a defect in membership. And I move the amendment. Amendment moved. Any members wish to participate? Dr Richard Simpson. Yes, I still have concerns because of the, the um, uh, amendment that we didn't actually vote on, on uh, the, the membership. Because again, if you only have three members and uh, a membership has been ended under Section 7, and a, uh, another member is unable to attend through illness, perhaps, you're down to one member. And that's why I still think that... I'm, I'm, obviously, we can't go back and debate it further, but uh, I, you know, I will raise the issue again, because I think that this then allows... could you know, allow a situation where only one or two people are taking action on our behalf as an independent body uh, and food standards, and I just don't think that that's wholly acceptable. Um, so I, I, I will not be opposing this, but I would give notice of the fact that I that I would or will be coming back at stage three, uh, subject to the presiding officer's agreement, uh, to raise this 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 collective within uh, um, as a debating matter for the Parliament to actually make a decision on. As you're entitled to do. Uh, Bob Doris? Just very briefly, I, I listened carefully before when the Minister was talking about composition of, of Food Standards Scotland and you gave reference to practice and other public bodies and there seemed to be a consistency across the approach. I'm just wondering in relation to, to this situation where the government position is, is, is for this amendment, would this achieve that consistency across other public bodies? just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're taking a consistent approach to it. No other members? Minister, then, to wind up, please. Well, the size of the uh, board, which uh, I should say is a, a board which is operating with seven members and a chair, uh, eight members of the board, um, a minimum uh, it would go down to is three members and a chair. That would be four members all in. Uh, uh, is it very similar. Uh, it's exactly the same as a number of other similar-sized type organisations. Uh, for example, the housing regulator, uh, the uh, uh, charities regulator as well, all of which are of a similar composition. And I'm not aware of any uh, problems or concerns that they've had regarding the size of their board. But as I've set out, uh, uh, our intention is for this to be a board which is uh, with uh, seven members and a chair. 
uh, and at a minimum it would at any point would ever be would be three and a chair. Uh, which I believe uh, gives the level of certainty it's required around decision making for a public body of this nature. Okay. Um, the question is then that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is then that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And can I now call Amendment 62 in the name of Aileen McLeod, already debated with Amendment 49. Aileen McLeod, to move or not move? Um, not moved. Uh, the question is then that section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, Thank you. Uh, can I now call amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 1. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, Thank you. Section 13, I call amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments 4, 5 and 6. Uh, the Minister to move Amendment 3 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, Convener, I move uh, the amendment. Uh, uh, amendment uh, 4 is the main amendment in this group. It goes together with Amendment 3. Uh, together, these amendments intend to remove the power uh, for Food Standards Scotland to delegate any of its functions to any other person. Uh, when drafting a bill, it was thought that there it may be circumstances in which Food, Sto Food Standards Scotland would need to delegate functions, especially in its first few months. Uh, good progress has been made in preparing for the new body uh, to fully take on its functions in April 2015. So we are now assured that any support needed thereafter could be contracted rather than delegated. Uh, this is a prefer uh, this is preferable uh, to giving the body uh, uh, preferable to giving the body a wide range of ability to delegate uh, functions, uh, and I uh, move the amendment. Amendments uh, five and six uh, are minor consequential amendments to ensure the provision in uh, section thirteen cross references uh, with each other. Okay, Richard Simpson. Speak in support of this motion. I, uh, I was um, had on my original notes deletion of B. Uh, but I do understand that in terms of the transitional arrangements, that might have been necessary. But to have it in the primary legislation seemed to me to be inappropriate. So I welcome the fact that the Minister is moving this amendment to withdraw that element. No other members? With the Minister's agreement, I will move directly then to the question. Uh, that Amendment 3 be ag agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I now call Amendments 4, 5... And six, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Uh, can I invite the Minister to move amendments four to six in block? Moved. Thank you. Um, do any members agree, uh, dis object to a single question be put on the amendments four to six? No. Okay. Um, if no member objects, of course, and that's what we've got, thankfully. And the question is that amendment four to six are agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is then that section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. Thank you. Um, I now call amendment 41 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, group with amendments 42, 43, 44, 45, 46 and 48. Um, Dr Simpson, to move amendment 41 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Yes, the main purpose of the, most of these amendments is actually to um, have consideration of whether we should not, um, as, a, as a whole, generally, but in respect of this bill in particular, be moving to only having online production. So the, the commentary, I think, which I've received, that this has the unintended consequences, that was actually the intended consequences. I think that... Uh, it may be that it should be modified by saying that the, that the boards such as Food Standards or the Food Scotland uh, Foods Agency should actually uh, produce an executive summary. But I think the days, frankly, when we get you know, 36, 45, 50 page re annual reports in, in the form of uh, expensive publications really uh, uh, should be over. So um, I'm, I'm moving these, emotion, these amendments as a testing amendment to see if the government are uh, uh, considering uh, moving, um, uh, moving in this way. Um, the amendment 45, which is in section 14, uh, page 7, line 5, um, 
is just to say that the food standards have to lay and uh, have to uh, provide an online copy uh, um, to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, now that may, you know, the fact that it's a copy, but it's an electronic copy, should be provided to the Parliament, and I think that that is a should be an absolute requirement that the food standards uh, agency should be required to do that, rather than may. Uh, I see no reason for them not being required to submit a report. I think it's the Parliament has to scrutinise these things, and therefore it should be it should be provided with a with a with a link to the Parliament uh, information site. Bob Doris. Um, Mayor, I wasn't going to speak on this. I hadn't really paid too close attention to the amendment, Dr Simpson, so my apologies for that. But just list, listening to your speaking and looking at some of the notes I have in front of me, slight tangential story, which I think is relevant in relation to this about online publications, is I've got a local community council who remain nameless, who, who haven't entered a, an IT age, let's say, and provisions have to be made for them to get hard copies of various publications and, and, not, and not online. Um, so I, I, I'll listen to what the Minister has to say and obviously uh, Dr Simpson is summing up but uh, to give a requirement that it must exclusively be online I think we'd have some concerns in terms of access for some groups within society but um, I'll listen carefully to what, what he says obviously No other members have intimated the uh, point to speak so I'll now go to the Minister uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, many of the amendments in this group, uh, I believe, are intended to ensure that Food Standards Scotland provides reports in uh, electronic or uh, in electronic form or online. Uh, this is good practice, and I would expect uh, a public body of uh, the nature of Food Standards Scotland to be doing this as a matter of practice. However, amendments 41 and 42 would effectively mean that Food Standards Scotland would only publish its reports online. Uh, and as Richard Simpson stated, uh, that's the intention of this particular uh, amendment. But I do believe that there could be adverse consequences uh, to this. Uh, this report, uh, approach to reporting could easily uh, deny access to a significant number of uh, consumers and interested parties in the way in which uh, Bob Doris uh, referred to. I don't believe that anybody would want to uh, see that. Uh, so I would ask the committee uh, not to support Amendment 41 and uh, 40. To, however, I'm more than happy to explore further with Richard Simpson if there is a, a way in which he uh, wishes to try and achieve this in a more manageable way uh, uh, to work with them to uh, try and achieve something at stage three. However, it's important that those who may not have access to online uh, or electronic versions uh, continue to be able to uh, uh, gain access to uh, Food Standards Scotland's reports. Amendments 43 and 44 uh, would also have an unfortunate and uh, unintended effect in the same way as Amendment uh, 41 and 42. Amendment 43 could lead to criticism that the Parliament was micromanaging the relationship between Food Standards Scotland and uh, Scottish Ministers by prescribing the way in which reports should be sent to Ministers And for Amendment uh, 44, uh, the way documents are laid in Parliament is already well regulated by uh, the Parliament's standing orders. And I would therefore ask that the Committee uh, does not support Amendment 43 uh, and 44 and uh, uh, suggest that Richard Simpson may wish to consider pursuing some of this matter through uh, the standing orders of uh, Parliament. Amendment 45, uh, uh, requiring Food Standards Scotland to lay all reports uh, prepared, uh, uh, even those uh, which are quite properly uh, not intended for publication uh, before the Scottish Parliament is unworkable in practice. Uh, it may even be unlawful to lay certain internal reports it prepares. Uh, the new body is under duties of transparency and to provide the public with information and advice. I believe that these duties will help to ensure transparency more effectively uh, than an overarching requirement to lay in Parliament all reports it prepares, and I would therefore ask the Committee not to support Amendment 45. Amendment 46 uh, would also have an unfortunate and unintended effect in the same way as Amendment 41 to 44. Amendment 46 it restricts the method by which reports can be published to just an electronic version. Electronic publication is commonly used as one type of publication, but we cannot make it the only method. Uh, so I would ask that the committee does not support this amendment. Amendment 48, uh, we believe, is unnecessary. 
The word document it needs no definition in the bill uh, to include an electronic communication. The word document in any act of the Scottish Parliament is already legally defined in the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 as meaning anything in which information is recorded in any form. So this amendment is unnecessary and I would therefore invite the committee uh, not to support this amendment. Dr Richard Simpson to wind up press or withdraw. Part of the purpose of moving this, um, this, this group of amendments was to try and um, make in a public record situation a, a, my view that we, we need to have a far more directive approach in terms of moving in a greater way to online. I welcome the Minister's offer to have further discussions with him about how this might be reasonably achieved whilst accepting Bob Doris's very valid point that there are still some people who are not IT literate and are really not keen to become IT literate perhaps, although I'm not wanting to cast aspersions on his councillor. Um, the fact that they can access it through the libraries may not be sufficient and therefore I accept that, that, that the points that are being made are valid, but I, I hope that we may have the opportunity of perhaps pursuing this in some way to make this a, an exemplar bill to begin to shift things towards online. And if I may help you, Convener, by saying that it's my intention to withdraw all the amendments in this block. Withdraw this one, because that's the other one. Yep. That's the only one we need, we'll need to go through it because the other ones need to be moved and then... On board. Okay. okay. So um, does anyone object to this one being withdrawn? Yes, we better ask uh, if one. anyone <laughs> objects <laughs> to this amendment being withdrawn. No, thank, th thank you. Um, we now call amendment. Will I tie that in block? And then, um, or do we need to do it all yeah, individually? We need to do it all individually. I'm afraid we do need to do it all individually. I now call amendment 42 in the name of Dr. Richard Simpson. Already debated with amendment 41. Um, Dr. Richard Simpson, is he moved or not moved? Not moved. Thank you. We now call Amendment 43 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 41. Dr Richard Simpson, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Uh, we now call Amendment 44 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 41. Move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Um, call Amendment 45 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 41. Dr Richard Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 46 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson, already debated with Amendment 41. Dr Richard Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Um, the question then is that Section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Great. Thank you. Um, we now move to call Amendment 47 in the name of uh, Dr Richard Simpson and a group on its own. Dr Richard Simpson to move and speak to the amendment. This was an attempt to be helpful to the Minister in the sense that uh, it may be that the charges that would be made for facilities at the request of any person um, uh, you know, in, in Section 15.2b uh, that the Minister would have the power to say that um, these charges should not be levied in certain circumstances, in circumstances that the minister themselves would define. Of no indication from any other members that they wish to speak in this debate, I now go to the minister. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, the effect of Amendment uh, 47 is that it would allow Food Standards Scotland to charge for facilities or services provided by it at the request of any person. Uh, which exceeds the reasonable costs of providing the facility or service concerned if Scottish ministers gave their approval. The effect of this is that Food Standards Scotland could charge more than uh, a reasonable amount for the cost of providing services. It's not clear uh, why we would uh, uh, that this would be considered to be appropriate given the purpose of Food Standards Scotland is not to profit from uh, providing such assistance. Therefore, I don't think this is something uh, that we should uh, take forward at Convener. Therefore, I ask the committee not to support this particular amendment. Dr Richard Simpson, to wind up, press no, or withdraw? No, um, no, no, nothing, nothing to say, and I with, uh, withdraw. Right, OK, thank you. Ask if anyone objects. No. Yes, I'll be, I'll be, <laughs> does, does any committee member object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. Thank you. 
The question is then that section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 7 uh, in the name of the Minister, group with Amendments 8 and 9. Uh, Minister, to move Amendment 7 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I move the amendment. Uh, as a uh, Convener, we touched on uh, an earlier debate, uh, Section 16 of the Bill, uh, inserts reference to Food Standards Scotland into various pieces of uh, legislation uh, which apply to uh, public bodies in Scotland. Uh, amendment uh, 7, 8 and 9 include Food Standards Scotland into several further acts. Amendment 7 uh, gives Food Standards uh, Scotland obligations under the Public Records Scotland Act 2011 to produce, implement and review its record, records management plan. Amendment 8 includes uh, Food Standards Scotland as a regulator uh, of the purpose of Part 1 of the Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014. Uh, this enables uh, the Scottish Ministers to make provision uh, to further uh, improve regulatory consistency, uh, to require regulatory functions to be exercised in a way that contributes uh, to sustainable economic growth and to encourage regulators to adopt practices that are consistent with regulatory principles. Finally, Amendment 9 includes Food Standards Scotland in the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014, and places general duties on uh, contracting authorities regarding their procurement activity and some specific measures aimed at promoting good, transparent and consistent practice in procurement. And I move Amendment 7. No, no members has indicated they wish to speak. Um, with your permission, Minister, we'll just forgo the wind-up and, and go right to the question, which, which is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Call Amendment uh, 8. Now, in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 7. Minister, you move formally. Moved. Thank you. Question is then that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. Call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 7. Minister, move formally. Moved. Thank you. Question is then that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thanks. The question is that uh, section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. question is then that six, section 17 to 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now we move to section 20 and call amendment 63 in the name of Aileen McLeod. Uh, and a group on its own, Aileen McLeod, to move and speak to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Convener. This uh, Amendment um, 63 seeks to amend Section 20 of the Bill and to uh, strengthen the powers in this section so that the FSS would also be able to require uh, food business operators to conduct uh, food testing and uh, disclose the results. Now, currently there's uh, no provision to give uh, FSS the access it needs to industry testing data and analysis, so the thinking behind this amendment is also to in intended to ensure that by requiring food company tests to be shared with the FSS, the nilly action can be taken whenever and wherever food fraud or food adulteration is detected to protect consumers and other businesses who rely on the same supply chain. Now, this is another amendment which I thought might be worth exploring further uh, with the Minister, and I think there could potentially be a positive impact in this area, and I'll certainly listen carefully to what the Minister has to say around this amendment. Richard Simpson? Yes, I think this is an important amendment at the moment, uh, and from the observations of the committee when we visited a particular unit in Aberdeen, uh, testing is done in three different, by three different groups. It's done by the food standards, it's done by the health and safety, and it is done by the individual factory seeking to maintain its quality control. And it seems to me that actually it should be possible for the uh, food standards to be able to say we are comfortable with the internal testing that is being done, or sorry, the testing being done by and promoted by the company itself with an, with an external tester, but it is essential that the Food Standards Agency should have access to that data, how it has arrived, what the nature of the, of the testing laboratory is, what their methodology is. So the purpose of this amendment, as, as Aileen McLeod has said, is, is, is partly to uh, give the FSS some control over something that the firm may be promoting as being 
you know, th their own quality control and may, not be, may, may or may not be adequate, but also to try and simplify the system and say, right, well, th that testing is something we can accept. That is adequate. We don't need to do further testing. And in fact, I would hope the health and safety executive would also do it as well, because if we can reduce the burden on industry, then we promote the government's desire to actually uh, strengthen our economy by streamlining some of the activities. No other member indicated they wish to participate in the debate. I can now go to the Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener, and I uh, welcome the intention behind this particular amendment. Uh, the amendment intends to address one of the recommendations made by Professor Jim Scudamore's expert advisory group following the horsemeat uh, fro food fraud incident. Uh, the Government supports the intention behind uh, this amendment, uh, but would like to go further. Uh, the Government believes the uh, amendment as it stands is not sufficient to achieve its desired effect to enable officers to act quickly in circumstances of food fraud or adulteration. Uh, the powers of observation uh, that the amendment seeks to alter uh, cannot in themselves be used to investigate whether a crime has been uh, committed. Instead of this amendment, uh, we are now considering uh, what can be done using existing legislation and considering the best timing for introducing a scheme to deliver the intentions behind this particular uh, amendment. If it cannot be achieved within existing legislation, uh, we will consider whether a further amendment should be brought forward at stage three in order to achieve the desired outcome of ensuring that Food Standards Scotland are able to compel access to the testing results that have been undertaken uh, by uh, private operators and uh, private uh, companies. Uh, and I'm more than happy to work with the uh, committee member uh, in looking to take this forward at stage three, if that's the appropriate way in which to uh, do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, whether we can ac accommodate it within existing legislation. Thank the Minister for that. Aileen McLeod to wind up press withdraw. Uh, thank you, Convener. I uh, certainly welcome uh, the Minister's comments that they uh, are supporting the intention of this amendment and now looking to go further, considering what can be done using existing legislation and the best timing uh, for that. So I'm uh, fully reassured that something is going to be done in this area uh, around um, the concerns that have been uh, raised. And uh, certainly I look forward to uh, seeing what the Minister will do in terms of whether it's going to be further legislation or whether there is possibility of bringing this back at stage three. Um, I, for that, and I'm, not, I'm quite content not to press the amendment uh, any further at this stage. Okay. Ask if any objects to be used. Yeah. Do any committee members object to the withdrawal of Amendment 63? No. Thank you. We now move then to the question that Section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that sections 21 to 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, Thank you very much. Uh, section 29, we call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 18, 19, 20 and 21. Um, Minister, to move Amendment 10 and speak to amendments in their group. Uh, convener, Amendment 10 is a minor drafting it changed to bring clarity to the provisions given uh, uh, which give uh, Food Standards Scotland the power to issue revised guidance as well as guidance. And I move Amendment 10. Uh, amendment uh, 19 uh, follows a recommendation by the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee uh, both to have the Lord Advocate publish guidance uh, to enforcement authorities and to allow uh, specified exemptions uh, for the Lord Advocate from publishing guidance uh, where it could be uh, prejudicial uh, to the administration of justice. Amendments, eight, uh, 18, uh, sorry, amendments 18, 20 and 21 uh, revise section 50 of the bill uh, to put the Lord Advocate's powers to revise guidance and publish revised guidance into the same style uh, as similar powers in Amendment 10 uh, and this achieves consistency across the bill. Um, no indication of members wishing to participate. No, to say anything. Um, with the minister's agreement, then we'll, we'll move directly to question uh, that is Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Question at 60, section 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question that section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. 
Section 31, uh, call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendments 24, 25, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 and 32. Minister, to move Amendment 11 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, Amendment 11 is a minor change in terminology, uh, and I move Amendment 11. Amendment 24, 25 and from 27 to 32, each make changes to a range of legislation, uh, changing references to the Food Standards Agency into references to, uh, the food stan to Food Standards Scotland. These changes are all consequential uh, to the creation of Food Standards Scotland and the removal of certain functions exercised in respect of Scotland from the Food Standards Agency. Thank you. No indication from members wishing to speak. Um, with the Minister's agreement, then we'll move directly to question that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. The question then is that Section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. question is that Section 32 and 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Section 34, call amendments 12 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 13. Minister, to move Amendment 12 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, convener, uh, Amendment 12 is a minor technical change in Section 34 on the regulations of animal feedstuffs. Uh, feeding stuffs. This uh, allows uh, orders regulating animal feeding stuffs uh, to be made uh, which are reasonably uh, similar uh, to, but not necessarily exactly equivalent to, uh, provisions in the Food Safety 1990 Act. Uh, this keeps the powers in Section 34 in line with the powers from Section 30 of the Food Standards Act 1990, which it is replacing. And can I move Amendment 12? Amendment 13 inserts a cap on the maximum penalty uh, that could be applied by uh, regulations made under Section 34 of the Bill, uh, which relates to animal feeding stuffs. Uh, this amendment is in response to another of the helpful recommendations made by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committees, uh, designed uh, restrictions uh, restricting the width of powers uh, appropriately. Thank you. No indication from committee members that wish to speak. With the Minister's permission, we'll press to the question. That is, Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now call Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 12. Minister, to move formally. Move. Thank you. And the question is then that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thanks. Question is then that section 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. The question is then that section 35 uh, to 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thanks. Section 48, call amendment 14 in the name of the minister. Group with amendments 15, 16, 17, 33 and 34. The Minister to move Amendment 14 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, Amendments 14 and 15 are minor changes to make clear that any regulations in subsection 2 and 3 of section 48 it would, it would be uh, made specifically uh, under the powers set out in subsection 1 and not under any other power in section 48. Uh, this change provides uh, certainty and I move Amendment 14. Amendment 16 is a minor change of language to remove duplication of the word under from the line, replacing it with the words referred to in. It does not change the effect of the subsection. Amendment 17 provides additional detail regarding the exercise of the power to make supplementary provision for fixed penalty notices and compliance notices. Uh, the Scottish Government is grateful to the Delegated Powers and uh, Law Reform Committee for supporting uh, the Delegated Powers in Section 48. The Committee recommended that the Scottish Government give consideration to amending the Bill so as to restrict the exercising of the power in these circumstances so that it does not permit the wholesale removal of the discharge of criminal liability, which Section 37 and 44 provide in circumstances where an administrative sanction has been issued and complied with. Amendment 17 it provides that protection. 
Amendment 33 and 34 make further changes which the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee recommended. Uh, the changes are uh, that uh, regulations under uh, specific, made under specific subsection of section 48 uh, would be introduced through negative procedure. Thank you. No indication from members that they wish to speak. Um, the Minister's agreement will proceed to the question. That is Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendments 15, 16 and 17, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 15 to 17 in block. Move. Thank you. Um, do any members um, disagree that we should be proceeding in block? No. no. Thank you. Um, then we move to the question that section... Sorry. Uh, if uh, we now move to the question that amendments 15 to 17 are agreed to, are we all agreed? The question is then that section 48 be agreed to, are we all agreed? The question is then that section 49 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, section 50, and I call amendments 18, 19, 20, 21, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move uh, Amendments 18 to 21 in block. Moved. Do any members object to single question being put on Amendments 18 to 21? No. Thank you. Um, the question is then that Amendments 18 to 21 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is then that Section 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is then that section 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Section 52, call amendments 22 in the name of the Minister. Group with amendments 23, 26 and 35. Uh, Minister to move amendment 22 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, I move uh, Amendment 22 in my name. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak to this amendment as the committee will recall that in uh, July uh, the uh, Scotland Act 1998 modification of Schedule 5, uh, Order 2014, uh, was passed. Uh, the order amended Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act 1998 in relation to uh, reserve matters on food and animal feeding stuffs and in doing so, it better aligned the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament with the executive competence of Scottish uh, ministers. Uh, amendments 23, 26 and 35 uh, make related changes to other sections in the Bill so that the new definitions can take full effect throughout the Bill. Thank you. Richard Simpson. I have a question, and that is, uh, can someone explain to me, because I couldn't find it, the definition of food under regulation EC number 178-202 as of the 7th of December 2004. In particular, I'm interested to know whether this includes any substances that may be consumed by human beings. In other words, does it include drink or uh, liquid, uh, liquid elements as well as uh, things that might be classified in the public's mind as food? It does include uh, drink. Uh, within the definition. Thank you. No other members have indicated they wish to participate. Um, I think the Minister has responded. Or do you wish to say anything else? No. Oh, OK, thank you. The question is then that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. question is that Sections 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Question is that section 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I now call amendment 64 in the name of Ailey McLeod. Already debated with amendment 49. Ailey McLeod to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Okay. Uh, the question is then that section 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that section 55 and 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, section 57, call amendment 48 in the name of Richard Simpson, already debated with 41. Dr Richard Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Okay. 
Um, I therefore call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 22. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is then that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is then that Section 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thanks. I now call amendments 24 to 32, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move amendments 24 to 32 in block and ask whether... Right. Move. Yep. Um, is there any member object to a single question being put on amendments uh, 24 to 32? No, no thank you. Uh, the question is then that Amendment 24 to 32 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I think that, that concludes. Oh. Just when you think it's all over. Uh, the question is then that ske the, the schedule be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call amendments 33, 34 and 35, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. And invite the Minister to uh, move amendments 33 to 35 in block. Moved. Does any member object to those questions being moved in block? Thank you. Uh, the question is then that amendments 33 to 35 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that section 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is then that sections 60 to 63 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is then that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? This ends stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you all for your participation and patience this morning. Thank you. Thank you to the Minister and his team. We're suspended at this point. We're only set up for a panel of evidence. You've got time. You've got time. Just boom, boom.
the, the um, uh, move to our uh, item seven on our agenda. Um, oh no, oh no, I'm doing well this morning. Move to agenda and item, item eight on our agenda, which is consideration of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Uh, and we have another um, round table of evidence. And as I usually do in, 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 in these round tables, um, we introduce ourselves. My name is Duncan McNeil, the convener of the committee and the MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde. I'll move to Gordon. My name is Gordon McInnes. I'm a development worker for Mental Health Network Greater Glasgow. Uh, Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and deputy convener of the committee. Uh, Andrew Strong, Policy and Information Manager at the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. Rhoda Grant, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Karen Martin, Mental Health Development Coordinator, Carers Trust Scotland. Uh, Ailey McLeod, MSP for South Scotland. Carolyn Roberts, Head of Policy and Campaigns at Sam H. Colin Keir, Edinburgh Western, MSP. Matt Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Shabeen Begum, Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance. Richard Lyle, MSP Central Region. Sue Kelly, Outreach and Development Officer, Inclusion Scotland. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP Mid Scotland and Fife. Um, Steve Robertson, um, chair, Chairperson for People First Scotland, who is the national self advocacy organisation for people with learning disabilities. And the organisation is also run by the members who all have learning disabilities. My name's Rona Neal and I work for Steve at People First. Gil Patterson, MSP for Claybank Mulgay. Can I uh, first of all welcome you all here this morning? I'm very pleased to, to, to have you and apologise for any inconvenience. We're not far off where we expected to start, but it's been a very busy morning for the committee. And uh, But we'll try very hard to give this um, uh, a normal serious consideration, which will be, in the main, to listen to the people and our guests that we invited along this morning. But in saying that, just to get things going, we need to ask a question, and, 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 and the Deputy Convener, Bob Doris, has agreed to do that to see where that takes us. Thank you, yeah. Bob. Uh, th th thanks, Convener. I was halfway through kind of crafting a first question, which was actually in relation to the short-term detention orders and the extension, which you can apply for from five to ten days in, in, before you have to apply for a compulsory treatment order and whether the balance of that was right. But actually, in the spirit that I think the convener has said, I don't want necessarily to focus on that. That's really just a kind of to open up the general discussion of whether you think the, the balance of additional powers taken within this bill are, are appropriate. So not actually tied down to that particular question, but that, that, that's the one I was thought of. But in the spirit the convener says, I think it's really for you to open up your views on the bill that we have before us. I see Karen showing an interest here. And Martin? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think from Carers Trust's point of view, we felt that the view of the, 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 the draft, the, the, the direction that the bill has taken has actually gone very clinical. Um, I think it's moved away from the sort of person centred recovery approach that, if you look at something like Mentally Flourishing Scotland had, the mental health strategy. Indeed, the carer strategy, which is all about working with people at grassroots level and building building that up, it now seems to have gone very um, clinical. Um, and there's not an awful lot of evidence about it working towards recovery of individuals with lived experience of mental health or, in fact, involving carers in any meaningful way at all, despite the fact that one of the principles underpinning the Act is respect for carers. Any other views on that, Andrew? Uh, yes, uh, as, as I said, I'm, I'm from the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland, um, and uh, we're a membership organisation of around about 780 members who uh, are made up of disabled people, people with long-term conditions, and third sector organisations working in health and social care. And, and earlier this year, we held our round table around about the mental health bill and, and the legislation that sits before us just now, um, with a, a, 
a group of organisations and people who kind of work with the Scottish Government on a wide range of, of these issues. And there were some quite deep concerns expressed, um, not least that the proposals were not particularly person-centred in their approach, despite the wider uh, push around about health and social care to encourage that, and not least in the 2020 vision for health and social care. Um, that the bill makes uh, a series of administrative duties um, in isolation of people and their rights, um, and that the bill's quite focused on updating existing legislation um, rather than reflecting on the range of developments there's been over the last decade. Um, and and I, I, I talk as someone from the Alliance, and, and we've got a strong push around uh, self-management, and I don't see much of that coming through in, in this piece of legislation. Caroline. I think if I can speak about the bill generally and then perhaps quickly um, touch on the particular issue of five to ten days. Um, the concerns we have around the bill are that there are several proposals which seem to reduce people's rights and to um, reduce their ability to participate fully, from the um, proposal to extend the nurse's power to detain to the quite limited nature of the proposals on um, appealing against excessive security, the proposal to um, decrease the length of time a person has to appeal against transfer to the state hospital, that's a really substantial um, decrease. And also the proposal to increase the, the length of time an assessment order can be extended from, from 7 to 14 days. The thing that they all have in common is that there's not a very de detailed case, in some cases not a case made at all, for why these are necessary. And yet they all, in one way or another, um, infringe on people's rights. So we are concerned that there are things being proposed in this bill that haven't been fully outlined and explored in the policy memorandum that would seem to affect people's rights. On the specific 5 to 10 day point, that, as you know, was proposed by McManus, and at the time we supported it, we have not at this point shifted our position, but we do know that the number of interim um, orders, which was the reason given for making this change, has fallen substantially. So we are looking for more information from government on the assessment they've made, what impact this will have, and if it's still required. Anyone else from our panel guests? Sue, do you? Okay. Um, well, I guess um, our response to the bill was very much um, informed by work we've been doing uh, to consult disabled people across Scotland uh, on whether the Scottish or UK governments are actually meeting their obligations um, under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. So I guess our concerns really all relate to the extent to which um, uh, this bill is really uh, being taken forward um, with proper uh, um, account being taken of the way that any changes in, 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 uh, have implications for people's human rights. And it does seem to, seem to us that the UNCRPD uh, um, is crucially important in the context of mental health provision, exactly because of the powers given to medical and legal professionals to deny what people would generally consider to be a person's fundamental rights. That's a massive, these are massive powers. Um, a person's right to freedom, a person's right to autonomy, their right to make decisions on their own behalf. It gives professionals the right to do things to human beings that in any other context, in any other context, including medical, con uh, medical context, other medical context, would be de deemed as torture or abuse. So giving these powers to professionals is not something that should ever be uh, treated as routine. And I, I think our concerns and the way we've been looking at, uh, at this and, and reviewing it, and certainly it's the basis of our submission, is the extent to which we think it may be, it may be moving in that direction, that it's more about administra administrative necessity than it really is about identifying people's uh, rights, which was the reason, I think, as well, why we, we brought, um, uh, we asked for uh, uh, people first to be represented at this meeting today, and I know that I know that Steve has something, uh, you know, uh, wants to speak to uh, these issues. Okay. Do you want to speak, to Steve? You, um, if you're not ready yet, there'll be opportunities to speak. Okay. So I have got uh, some views. Um, from People First, it's our input on mental health. Um, so will I just go with that then? Yes, whatever you're comfortable with, of course. Okay, I was just checking. No, you're fine, you're right. fine. Okay, um, most disabled people, whatever their disability or whatever their impairments, 
get treated less well than the general population. People with learning disabilities in most areas of life are even more disadvantaged than our friends and colleagues in the wider disability movement. In healthcare, for instance, we can expect to die 20 years sooner than other people. Educational opportunities are denied to us through a lack of adequate support and through inflexible systems. A greater number of crimes are committed against us, including sexual abuse. Our right to have relationships and start a family is blocked and prevented in all sorts of ways. And, most importantly for today, our rights to equal treatment under the law is quite simply denied to us. The Mental Health Care and Treatment Act describes us as mentally disordered. In our open letter to all MSPs, earlier this year, we described our experiences as this. In Scotland, the Mental Health Act defines us as mentally disordered because of our learning disability, however caused or manifested, and allows us to be detained and treated for our mental disorder, even though we know that there is no treatment or cure for a learning disability. Ours is, the only ours, ours is the only permanent impairment which is defined in this way and dealt with in this way. So because of that, we are routinely denied access to justice and anyone with a learning disability who commits an offence can be simply diverted away from the criminal justice system and into the health system and forensic services. While that sounds like a good thing, what it means in practice is that we can be detained for many years, restricted in nearly everything we do, sometimes for the rest of our lives. And there are at the moment many people with learning disability in Scotland that this is happening to. The safeguards in the system are mostly controlled by psychiatrists. And we do accept that some psychiatrists are kind and well-meaning people. But we don't accept that psychiatrists have a monopoly on understanding and managing people with learning disabilities. If a psychiatrist says that someone needs to be detained and restricted, watched and escorted, and that advocacy isn't in their best interests, that's pretty much the end of the story. But it should not be. We are asking to be taken out of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act. We say that most of the provisions of the Act do not apply to us and have little or no relevance to us. Our view is that we would benefit from help and support to learn and additional time to learn and remember, rather than treatment for a disability which we will have for all of our lives. In fact, things called treatment for us are most often about restrictions on our lives anyway. The other major assault in our human rights is the way that the Adults with Incapacity Act is being used and applied to us. When the, when the Act was first drafted and passed, we were very pleased about it and supported it. The principles of the Act are very sound and the Act makes clear that all other less restrictive options must be considered and applied before guardianship orders are granted and that capacity is not an all or nothing idea. But over the last few years, sheriffs in Scotland have begun citing each other and claiming that where a person has been found by a psychiatrist, to lack capacity on the basis of their mental disorder, then a guardianship becomes the least restrictive option in order to protect the person from claims of deprivation of liberty. We think it's very scary that Scottish sheriffs claim to be protecting us from deprivations of liberty 
by removing all of our rights to self-determination. We think it's quite shocking that firms of solicitors are urging parents to apply for guardianship orders before we reach the age of 16, meaning we might never ever experience adult citizens' rights in our own country in the 21st century. We honestly believe the time has come for a new piece of legislation that is just about, pe just about people with learning disabilities. We think it's only right and fair that learning disability is properly defined as an intellectual impairment rather than a mental disorder. With that definition, we would want recognition that additional time to learn, support to understand things together with easy read documents and support to make some decisions are what we need. We need those things to help us take part in our communities rather than the restrictions, the tensions and efforts to keep us apart from the world we want to live in. Um, and I just wanted to finish by saying um, I know that this, is not, this hasn't been an easy thing to say and some people may feel uncomfortable with what I've said, but these are the facts. Thanks. Uh, Bob, you asked the original, thanks Steve, you asked the original question, it encouraged I, I the responses. And yeah, I don't think we Richard can leave, I don't think we can leave your, your statement to the committee hanging, that would be an inappropriate thing to do. Um, so I, I don't want to do that. So apologies that all I might do at the moment is mirror a couple of the comments you make back to you. And then I think what you're doing is placing a challenge on our committee, which is clearly out with the scope of this bill, but if I was you, I would have taken this opportunity to put your views on the record, and that's precisely what you've done, and I respect that. So I suppose I'm just mirroring a couple of things back, convener, and the two things I'd written down was the definition of those living with uh, learning disabilities uh, and the appropriateness, or otherwise, uh, Steve, uh, to be deemed as mentally disordered, and you used the expression intellectual impairment and how there, 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 there perhaps should be different processes in place to support people uh, living with uh, learning disabilities. And I've written that down, and we, we have to consider that, not within this legislation, but you've taken the opportunity directly to raise that with us. Um, and the second thing that you also mentioned was in relation to how the Adults with Incapacity Act um, impinges, as you have said, on... On, on the rights of those living with learning disabilities and you mentioned specifically guardianship orders and how uh, entire freedoms, you, I think you, you spoke of um, degrees of independence and, and liberty and freedoms and guardianship orders perhaps taking everything from certain people with learning dis disabilities. Now, I'm just, I, I will now just leave that hanging there but I thought given the, the powerful statement it would be wrong not to to respond to, I thought the most reasonable follow-up question might be one of advocacy because within the the piece of legislation we are dealing with, there are additional powers that are taken by by, by professionals and from my reading of it, uh, well-intentioned and with some rationale behind why additional powers have been taken but every step of the way where you, the, clearly there's a impingement upon people's rights, perhaps acceptably, perhaps because of clinical evidence, there's still a strong need for advocacy there. So I don't know. I know I know Shabim's got some strong views in relation to advocacy within the bill, and I don't know if that would be the, the, the most appropriate way convener to take the discussion forward next. But I, as always, we're, we're in your hands. But I didn't want just to leave your, your, your quite powerful statement hanging there, Steve. No, I, I, that's, okay. um, I, that's great, and I really respect um, everything you've said there. And I just want to say thank you. If And that's, thank you for that anyway, and... Much uh, appreciated. Thank you. Okay. I think you were named, you mean. Um, I just want to um, support the, the points that, that Steve has made about Sorry. access to advocacy. Um, recently, we produced um, some research called the, the Map of Advocacy, which covers 2013-14. <coughs> um, and, and that's just a snapshot of what happens in the world of advocacy in Scotland. And so we, we ask all advocacy organisations and all NHS and local authority commissioners and funders 
how much money they spend on advocacy. And to, to go back to Steve's point, one of the, the, the issues that's come out is that funding for advocacy has either been frozen or there's been a cut. And overall, we found that there was a um, uh, funding for advocacy had gone down per head for, by one pence. But the demand for advocacy increases year on year. And it, for this edition of the map, it went up by 8%. And one of our areas of concern that we share with people first is that people with a learning disability um, still, even though they've got a legal right to access an independent advocacy under the Mental Health Act, still don't have access to advocacy in the way that they should. So there are people who, if they're not detained, um, and, and Steve was talking about some of the, the kind of extreme ends of the spectrum where people might be in forensic settings, but and, and those people do have some access to advocacy, not in the way that we want to see it, but I want to concentrate on the people who are in the community who might be leading isolated lives, who, um, and we were talking about this outside the meeting, who are isolated in so many different ways through lack of social networks, through lack of family and friend networks, and advocacy provides a vital life link for them um, in terms of social inclusion, but also in terms of safeguarding their rights. And people with learning disabilities are one of those groups that still don't have the right level of access to advocacy because if they're in a situation where they're in the community, they've got very limited networks, they might not be in, in receipt of the CPN or their mental health officer or, or those kind of services. Um, and, and they're less likely to find out about advocacy. And, and we found that fewer and fewer uh, men, uh, mental health professionals are, are, are telling people about advocacy. We've got research that shows that um, it, there was in-depth research um, interviewed 12 pe uh, people with a learning disability throughout Scotland and the majority of them said that they'd never been told about advocacy. So we're talking about adults who were in their 30s, 40s, 50s who had never found out about advocacy from a statutory source. So they, their CPN or their social worker hadn't told them about advocacy. They had found out about advocacy through other people that they knew or through collective advocacy or self-advocacy groups. So we're finding out that people don't find out about advocacy in time and the majority of people who took part in the qualitative research said well do you know I wish I'd some, somebody had told me about advocacy because it could have saved so much so much misery and distress in my life it could have made huge difference to my life if only I'd known about advocacy if I'd known about my rights if I'd known that I could challenge decisions that were being made about me whether that was about financial freedom or freedom to make decisions freedom to have relationships freedom to do all the things that you and I do including the mistakes that we all make and that's one of the things that that is one of the reasons that is used by professionals in terms of safeguarding people with a learning disability that we're, we, we really value uh, or, or give a lot of consideration to risk, whereas all of us make terrible mistakes in our private lives every day and we have the freedom to do that and actually People with a learning disability don't have that free, those, those same freedoms and don't enjoy the same level of, of, of freedom and being active citizens within our society. Sorry, I've been waffling now. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> You've got a Gordon. particular question I can answer on, on advocacy. Gordon. I suppose it's a supporting statement. Um, our organisation has a contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to, in, to do what basically is user involvement work in mental health, but we're also a service user-led organisation with 600 members. We've, I've been, our perception at the moment is that services are firefighting, that they're very much on the back foot and that they're not looking to do work that's proactive. Um, and I think that's a, it's the other part of the advocacy element here. You can kind of get a person when they're unwell and support them through the tribunal process, that's fine. But very little work is being done that's proactive with people. And you have, I mean, we had a peer promotion of advanced statements and it was hugely successful um, in the sense of our limited capacity can deliver it. It's a sideline to my paid job. Um, but basically what we had was we, we took people from being very cynical about advanced statements so they can be overruled to basically service users saying everyone should have one and everyone should have the narrative to engage with um, a, about advanced statements. The issues you have with carers, for example, around access to information can be contained in that. Your attitudes to treatments. This is a service user taking responsibility to tell services 
what they need to know about their care and treatment. They're putting it on a plate. Glasgow has two da um, in, 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 in computer systems. One's Genesis, one's EPOS. If you have an advanced statement, an alert flashes up. And Genesis is a central database. You could download the documents. You could get an advanced statement in most mental health settings in Glasgow 24-7, 365 days a year. The fact that there's so few of them made is because I think practitioners don't have the capacity to do proactive work. But they're a huge part, potentially, of greater involvement in your care and mental health treatment and improving outcomes. We, we promote them as a document that improves crisis response, minimises your time in hospital, minimises, improves your recovery post that. That probably has a financial implication for the NHS. And were that, that sort of approach to be adopted on a larger scale, I think you could see some significant improvements, not just in the rights element, but in the treatment element. I'm going to go to my parliament panellists again. So to, to the committee members, I've got Gilman and one in from Richards, one in Rhodes, but uh, um, Karen. Yeah, I think I'd just like to um, echo what Shabine had said and Gordon, but to pick a plea for carers because the, um, the the advocacy services that are available for carers are even less well known about. Um, and if we're looking at the, the people that we consulted throughout Scotland, including young carers um, and condition specific charities that work with carers, with people with various mental illnesses or whatever, what they were um, what they were saying is that had we known that we could access advocacy, or if I knew that there was advocacy there but I can't access it because it's full or it's not operating in my area, um, then that may have made a difference to whether they became a named person or not. And it may have given carers more of a say and more of a confidence and a voice to actually take part in uh, treatment decisions, etc., and could have actually allayed a lot of family issues um, and relationship issues. So I, I think Carers Trust certainly would have liked to have seen more within the bill around the rights for carer advocacy as well um, to support carers. Um, and I agree with Gordon about building it into the advanced statement is, is great, but we do need to promote and publicise the whole power and the role, sorry, not the power, the role of the named person as stated in McManus, and that was a huge, huge disappointment to carers that that was not reflected in the bill. Andrew, on this subject? Yeah, I, I was going to mm. just say a bit, um, advocacy be mentioned in McManus is something that needed more promotion and that um, there was a direct issue around about the pro appropriate provision and associated funding for um, advocacy. Um, and at the moment, that issue is further exacerbated by the perfect storm scenario affecting lots of disabled people and people with long-term conditions around about welfare reform, cuts to services. Um, and, and also, um, I don't know whether the committee noted that um, this week um, the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey um, revealed that there was an increase in stigma and, and discrimination over the last few years um, towards people um, with, who, who, who were in the scope of this bill, people with mental health problems, people with learning disabilities. Um, and advocacy can be a tool for challenging that. Um, but what we've got at the moment is a block on... We, lots of people can't access it because there's, there's not enough provision out there. Um, I, I think that the Scottish Government, and we think that potentially the Scottish Government, we would support a, a, a monitoring of um, access to independent advocacy that's out there at the moment and consequences for um, local authorities and health boards are required where people can access those services and, and also a greater empowering of people to uh, report failings around about advocacy is, is, is probably required too. So whether that's in the scope of this legislation or, or not, I'm, I'm not sure, but there's, there's definitely a, a gap there somewhere. Any other panellists on that one? Just... Yes, Gordon. Okay. Sorry, I don't know if, I, if I'm stopping this up here. I think also as well, when you're looking at the, um, somebody taking up that role, the other element of this is if somebody like, say, a mental health officer takes up that role. Um, I, 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 when we put our submission in, I think there's two issues. I think if a family member does it, they often lack the advocacy skills or the knowledge of the mental health treatment process or the, the, le the legal frameworks. When a mental health officer often does it, it's often, or sorry, when a, when a professional often does it, it's often at very short notice and they don't know the person. 
And I think that, you know, those are both impacts. They both impact. And one of the things I would suggest is that there should be some strict, there should be some, some rules around that to give a, you know, because we are often hearing it's happening at the last minute that, that people are being nominated with um, a named person who's a professional. They may not know the person and how can they therefore, you know, really argue there. They may have the skills and the knowledge of the system, but how can they really argue on behalf of that person? The, the research that the Mental Welfare Commission published last year that was a, a series of focus groups throughout Scotland um, talking to people who'd used mental health services and the majority of people didn't know anything about named person or advanced statement or independent advocacy and didn't know anything about their rights under the Mental Health Act. But the people who did know about their rights in terms of named person and advanced statement were the people who'd used advocacy or had been new involved in a collective advocacy group. And so advocacy has shown time and time again that it's a really useful vehicle for, for people ha having um, a better knowledge an understanding of what their rights are and people are more likely to, to nominate a named person and have an advanced statement well if they know about them in the first place but if they've got an advocate who's supporting them we, we've got lots of members who, who do lots of work around raising awareness about what a named person is and what their responsibilities are and what, how that, that role can help the service user but also they help lots of service users draw up advanced statements and think about what's going to be a robust advanced statement. So I think that advocacy needs to be recognised in, in the role it plays in terms of just generally raising people's awareness about their rights, but specifically about those two additional safeguards in the, in the Act. Karen, I think you want to back in into two. I'll get you there. Yeah, I would, I would agree with, again, with what Shabin had said. It was also around the, um, when we were consulting with carers through our network partners through Scotland and Young Carers Services Alliance, um, the time and time again, what we had to spend time doing was explain what a named person was, explain what we meant about an advanced statement and explain where carers fitted into being a named person and separate out the role of the named person from the primary carer if they're not one in the same person. Um, and I think that greater um, awareness is needed, as, as was recommended by McManus, around the role of the named person and the consequences of taking on that. It is quite a powerful role and there is a lot of consequences around um, taking on, especially if you are the sibling of someone who's a, who has a mental health problem or you're the wife or the husband, mother, father, whatever, um, it can actually interfere with a lot of family relationships. And it's also why within Carers Trust and the Scottish Young Carer Services Alliance, we would like to have seen the McManus recommendation about 16-year-olds um, being able to nominate named persons um, to bring that into line with some of the other legislation as well around the legal age of capacity, etc. Um, a lot of young adolescents struggle um, between families, you know, you don't have to have a mental disorder to have poor family relationships, but if you've got a mental disorder on top of that and it's your parents that are taking parental consent and giving that consent when you are 16, 17, there seems to be an, a, an anomaly there. And certainly the common view was, if I can vote when I was 17, why can't I make a decision over who's going to represent or be in my best <laughs> interests um, or whatever? So I think that there's a lot of things around the name person that... As far as ourselves, Scottish Recovery Network, Glasgow Association for Mental Health, Support Mild, um, we feel that the the government have missed a lot out that, that McManus certainly would have given robust powers and, and responsibilities and awareness to the role of the named person, which will also impact onto the service user as well, because then they can start to work um, together better. Two. Yeah, I mean, I really want to just um, uh, echo a lot of what everybody's been uh, saying so far, especially in relation to advocacy. Um, uh, and it does seem to me, I mean, you talked about um, uh, McManus, and it does seem to me that the principles on which the 2003 Act rests, you know, are completely disrespected if people don't have, actually have the support they need to make their own decisions um, and don't have the support they need, the advocacy uh, availability to be able to challenge substitute decision-making. That, that seems to me that if you, if you don't have that, then it undermines the, the whole spirit of the, the legislation, which was supposed to be so groundbreaking. Um, and I think um, uh, that 
it shouldn't just be. I mean, what, what we're hearing is that uh, from people that we've spoken to is that it shouldn't just be about, uh, you know, advocacy in a time of crisis, um, but it should be early, early uh, independent advocacy provided. Um, uh, and, you know, things like the sort of peer advocacy projects um, encouraged. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of sort of planning support very early on, and considering what sort of treatment, again, you know, everything that's been said about advanced statements, um, um, we echo as well. Um, and, and that, of course, would help to uh, prevent a deterioration of mental health um, and avoid the necessity for compulsory treatment, where, you know, this is, is such a, a, a difficult issue. And I know there's lots of debates at the moment about compulsory treatment um, and, and, and whether or not that is in it in and of itself a total um, denial of somebody's uh, 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 human rights. Um, but, you know, this would be a way of absolutely avoiding any of those situations, I think, if people got early, uh, early advocacy and were actually able to make informed decisions uh, when they went at a point when they're, they're really not uh, feeling so unwell. And, of course, that, the, the whole issue about the advanced statements, I mean, we've certainly, in our submission, um, on the basis of what people have told us, um, asked, uh, said that we would like to see a statutory duty placed on health boards to promote um, advanced statements and uh, make sure that people ha are fully informed about what uh, making an advanced statement means. Carlene, did you want to, on, this, on, a, on this subject again? Yeah, very quickly, though. Right, yeah. um, I don't know if I'm speaking here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think as well, there are two points at which you probably likely need an advanced statement. One is the tribunal process and one is your treatment under crisis. And I think, you know, they're quite often when the proactive work bears fruit and this is part of the the kind of point to make about advanced statements often the treatment process is like a conveyor belt and the people in the hospital will not see the benefit of the community work and the community work will not see the benefit of of the kind of crisis work and i think you need to tie those things together and that's why i stress the importance of the advanced statement as a proactive document a well-written advanced statement when you are in the community might not make a big impact but if you become unwell again it will. If the tribunal process can find adequately to support you, it can prove. That's why I mean when I made the, make the statement, I think a well-written advanced statement can improve almost every aspect of your mental health care and treatment. Uh, Gil, did you, did you, do you want to take us on to another subject? Yes, maybe? Another subject. Great. That, I, th I think uh, yeah, supplementary on this. Supplementary board you mentioned um, the availability of the advance statement. We've had some um, witnesses giving us evidence about the confidentiality, and what you yeah. s seem to say is that it's very accessible. How do you deal with the confidentiality? I, I, I mean, we've supported, um, we, I've supported peers to do sessions with people who have had things in their advance statement about things like disinhibited behaviours and other very sensitive issues. If you're having a central database, I think you have a very clear kind of access requirement. When we do the work, we have uh, we get the person to draw up a list of people who have copies of that statement, and they put it in with a statement and the names and addresses. So there's a distribution list, if you like, and that would be the GP, that would be the psychiatrist, as well as the people who are named persons, carers, or whatever role you're taking. Now, the, the assumption is that they will discuss it with them, and any kind of issues around access to confidentiality can be discussed in that. That's why it's not, you know, it's, it's a kind of, po but it requires somebody to sit down and do that proactive work. Who should be on your list? What should be in your statement? Who should be um, getting access to this information? And if they're not happy about possibly receiving information or giving information, then don't put them on the list. But a lot of our members are very socially isolated as well, so they don't have a huge list of people they can draw upon. Can I, sorry, convener, I should have um, referred members to my register of interest before we started because I have an intern from Inclusion Scotland. Okay. Yeah. Caroline, did you just want to help us conclude this bit? And we'll move on. on that specific point regarding confidentiality about advanced statements, um, I wanted to make the point that advanced statements are a great tool. I would absolutely echo what, what Gordon said, and we really think people need to be encouraged to make more of them. We know that um, when we've done research on, on uh, the experience of being detained, people have said either they don't know about them or they don't believe they will have any weight. So we absolutely welcome the fact that the bill introduces this register of advanced statements, but people have expressed to us concerns about um, the fact that the entire advanced statement will be held within that register and said, well, who's going to be able to see that? That's a really, really personal document. So in our evidence, we have proposed, um, ideally, 
that the register should hold only the fact that a statement has been made, the date that it was made, um, and who you contact to get it. Now, we think that would really reassure people and would still um, let the register do everything that it should do. Failing that, we really would urge that the, um, the provisions on who can access that statement should be tightened up. The bill at the moment says... Um, that the mental health officer, the responsible medical health officer or medical officer can see it, which is absolutely right. But it also says that anyone acting on the person's behalf and the health board can access the statement. Those are incredibly broad definitions and we would strongly urge that they need to be tightened. On, on that side. Yes, I, mean, I think we should be aware of the fact that in the last time we looked, there were 900 breaches in health boards of people accessing confidential data that they shouldn't do. So I think that the witnesses are producing a very valuable point. I have always been of the view that the person who should hold it, provided that the individual is confident about it, it should be held by the general practitioner. And a lot of confidential information should be held at that level and only accessed if the, if the patient and the GP are in agreement that it should be accessed. But that's just general application. I think the whole issue of privacy and confidentiality, which has now been raised, is an issue we need to return to. But in the context of this bill, I would support what Caroline saying that, in fact, it should be a register of the existence of the advanced statement and not the full content of it. To have health boards being able to access the advanced statement, I think, is, not, is, is far too broad. It has to be much more tightly defined. OK, Bob, on this. And, and Gil, I'm not even really patient I'm waiting to get in here, but just on, on, on the advanced statement... Um, I, I'm taking on board the fact that um, seeing uh, health boards can get it is a fairly broad definition and that might need some tightening up in what, what you mean by that. If the advance statement is held by the GP or another trusted individual uh, and it's only a register that one exists, are there any points, I don't know the answer to this question, the reason for asking, are there any times of, of crisis where you need quick and speedy access to that advance statement within, I don't know, minutes, hours, whatever, yeah. where you might not access it from the GP. So I'm not, I'm not arguing against that, Dr Simpson. I'm just thinking, is there practical reasons for where you would need to get that as quickly as possible? Well, up at Parkhead Hospital at three in the morning. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, there are times when you need to have that quickly. Everybody's broadly agreed with that. Is that right? Oh... Okay, Gil, can you take us on? Maybe sure, yeah, thanks things. very much, uh, convener. Uh, it's uh, Carol, Caroline had already raised this very, very quickly in her uh, contribution at the start, and it's in regards to appeals on hospital transfers and the rights of uh, managers to effectively transfer patients from one established, uh, established, established plan to another and their right of appeal is uh, under the proposals would be cut from 12 weeks to four weeks. And uh, the committee questioned uh, the welfare, uh, Mental Welfare Commission, and I don't want to kind of put words in their mouth, but basically uh, their main concern, uh, not so much that the right's been taken away or reduced. I, in some cases, I believe they thought that was the right thing to do, because the patient required treatment that couldn't be provided in any particular establishment, can't get it out, but it could be uh, in another. But their main concern, uh, but maybe the, the, the panel here has, has got a different concern entirely, and not to dwell on what I'm going to say if it's irrelevant, but their main concern was the loss of a bed in the establishment that they uh, are uh, housed in at that particular time, but removed to somewhere else against their wishes, uh, maybe, but then would have no right uh, to go back. Yeah. Can I? Yes, yes totally. thank you. Um, I, th I think it's a really good point to raise. Um, the, the specific provisions are referring to transfer to the state hospital specifically, mm -hmm. um, which obviously is the most high security hospital that we have. Our concern about people being transferred um, and about the, this reduction, which is a very substantial reduction in the, the timescale that you have to appeal, again, it's one of these proposals in the bill that isn't very well outlined in terms of why it's felt to be required. Um, the argument given is that um, it, it delays treatment that might be urgently required, but we don't understand that. The existing Mental Health, Health Act, as it stands, allows the tribunal to order that a person should be transferred pending an appeal. 
So we just don't think that argument has any substance. You can be appealed imme uh, transferred immediately pending your appeal, which I think brings us to the Mental Welfare Commission's point that they're concerned that the bed at the original hospital might be lost. I'm told, I don't have the details, I'm told that has happened at least once, that a person has been transferred to the state hospital, um, won their appeal against being transferred, but their bed in the descending hospital was no longer there. That clearly is an issue. Um, I read the evidence that the Commission had gave, and I, I think they proposed that the person's bed ought to be guaranteed until the appeal has played out. That seems entirely sensible to me, but it does not seem to necessitate a reduction in appeal timescales from 12 weeks to 28 days when the tribunal can already direct that a transfer should take place pending the outcome of an appeal. Anyone else on that? Richard? Richard, it's actually the previous sections, 10, 11, 12, regarding the level of security at the moment. That's applied only to the state hospital, but after RM versus Scottish ministers, the bill now proposes to extend it to medium secure units, which now we have supposedly an adequate supply of. I mean, the, the building programme for that has been completed with the Murray Hall development. That's now one in Glasgow, one in Edinburgh, and the Murray Hall one. So we have a supposedly adequate medium secure unit. But the point that some of the witnesses have made in their evidence is, why only stop at that? What about the lower secure uh, unit? Because the Milan principle was the least restrictive, and surely you should have the right of appeal if you're being restricted in any way. Um, so I, I wonder if the witnesses would like to uh, comment whether they feel that the bill should be amended at this stage, not just to go to medium secure, but to go to loose, low secure. What are the arguments for and against that? Um, yeah, we agree that um, the, the provision to appeal against excessive security should apply <coughs> to people in, in low security. We agree that absolutely was the intention of Milan, that the principle of least um, excessive security should apply. Um, we obviously there's been a, a court case about this, the, the RM case that you referred to. The person who brought that case was himself in low secure, um, a low secure setting, um, and we, we know that it's possible to move from a low secure hospital setting to a community based order. So we believe the Scottish government's argument for why this shouldn't happen and um, why the, the right to appeal should be confined to medium secure is that an appeal against low secure accommodation is essentially an appeal against detention itself because the next step would be to be in the community. We don't agree with that. You can move from one level of security to another but still be in low secure accommodation. Um, we think that the right should apply as widely as possible and we note that this um, part of the bill is to bring in um, a provision that was made in the original Mental Health Act. It's, it's bringing in regulation. The intention of the original Mental Health Act, it would appear to us, would be um, to allow that right against appealing against excessive levels of security to apply as widely as possible. So we simply don't see um, why, why it wouldn't. We do have concerns about whether there is sufficient low-level um, secure provision, given that we're going to see people able to appeal against medium-level security. We would like to see some work done on that in terms of what low-level secure accommodation is available. Is it enough? What more do we need to do to develop that estate? John Crichton, who said that the low secure provision, now we've got medium secure sorted, we need to really look yeah. again at low, low secure. I think the other thing is we did debate when the Act was going through, uh, we did debate the question as whether this should apply to lower levels of security, but at that point of course we didn't have community treatment orders. Mm -hmm. We've now had 10 years, 11 years of experience of the CTOs, and therefore we should regard those as another form of detention in my view. It is a restriction on liberty, even though it is a, a restriction within the community. And it's the point that Steve Robertson, I think, was making very eloquently earlier on, but we need to look at that, as indeed I think we do about learning disability, though it may not be possible within the limits of this rather limited act. Um, can I just say one more thing, convener? I think, well, Steve, yeah, in relation yeah, you to... You can, Dr. Summer, but you're not giving evidence today. You're I know. I, just, I was just a comment on uh, Steve Robertson's position as a as a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatry. <laughs> I hope I'm one of the, <laughs> the kind psychiatrists he was referring to, but he maybe tell me later. Um, but I was, I was really disturbed to hear that, that, that somebody could say that advocacy wasn't appropriate to an individual. I can't think of circumstances, frankly, in which advocacy is not appropriate, and I wonder if the witnesses can help us here. Are there any circumstances in which it's appropriate not to suggest that advocacy would be something that the, that the, that the individual might wish to consider taking up? 
Can I, can I remind people that, you know, uh, Gil's original question about security and the questions that flowed from that before we go back into it's an additional question, Richard. So any of any points from the last um, two points from the committee members? And maybe you want to come in just to tell me that before we get a response from our panellists? Yeah, I, I obviously would rather hear witnesses' opinion on the, the security issue rather than me ask it. But it is about that I was going to yeah, ask yeah, a yeah, question you on. do that and then we'll, then we'll have some response. Um, OK. Um, <coughs> I, I, I apologise if I'm just showing my ignorance by asking this question, but I'm, try, I'm trying to get my head around the point that was made there. If you're transferring um, someone from the lowest secure setting, not in the community, I appreciate that, to another facility which is also a lowest secure setting, or you're moving them from a more secure setting <coughs> to a less secure setting, I'm unsure why you would be able to appeal saying that the, the the security was w w w was excessive when what you're actually doing is, is lessening the, the constraints on them or or not changing them and that that, that, that that's I'm trying to make a common sense view of what what I'm hearing I appreciate there may then be a difference between moving from a low the low secure setting to a community order and that's a different issue but just in terms of when you when you transfer someone from one establishment to another and the level of security is the same, why there would be to appeal against excessive security? Are there not other mechanisms available if you think, irrespective of whether someone's being transferred from one hospital to another, that you wish to contest the detention? I hope that makes sense. I'm just trying to understand the provisions within no, the maybe, bill maybe, and why maybe, it's unreasonable. Maybe, maybe the panellists will, will, mm. will give us a, a wider sense of... Mm. Uh, of whether a security or appropriateness of mm. where you are at any given time, I suppose. Sure. Maybe some response to that, Caroline. I don't know if I've seen Gordon nodding there. Or no, not. I was just agreeing. Was with this nodding of off? Yeah. Right, then, <laughs> Caroline. Um, I'm not sure I've fully understood the question. I'll, I'll try to. Um, I don't. Maybe I wasn't being clear in, 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 um, when we were talking about um, appeals against excessive security. So the provisions in the bill would give effect to the provisions in the original Mental Health Act that said that you should have the right to appeal against being held in um, excessive levels of security. And that came in for the state hospital, which is the highest level of security. You can now appeal against being held there and you would move to medium secure if your appeal was successful. And what we're arguing for is a similar right at every level. So you can appeal against medium secure and move to low level, which is contained within the bill. But you should also be able to appeal against a low level um, and perhaps move to a community um, setting. So we're looking for that right throughout. This wouldn't affect if you were being transferred from one, for example, medium secure facility to another. That wouldn't come into play because you're perfectly right. Your level of security is not changing. I don't know if have I understood the question right. No, 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 no that, that, that's ideal. So if, right. if you are, if you're currently today in the lowest form of secure setting, um, are you saying this, there's a standing right to appeal that should exist full stop? Are there not already mechanisms in place where you can, where you get a review of mm -hmm. the compulsory treatment order? And anyway, I'm just asking where the difference is. Is that a standing right to appeal from being in the lowest secure setting on an ongoing basis, or is it at the point of transfer? Can I come back? Yes, please. Yes. You can appeal against a hospital transfer, but these are specific rights that are based on being held in a level of excessive security. An appeal against a hospital transfer could be about a number of different um, issues about appropriateness, clinical care and so on. This is specifically um, being able to argue I am being held in a level of security that, that is not necessary. Irrespective of possibly. I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding when I'm, when I'm talking about transfers. It's just if that's where you are, you can appeal it. Yes. Okay, is that not taking part of, like, if, if you've got a compulsory treatment order which has resided you, which says that that's where you should be, is, that, is there not a statutory review process within that anyway? Every two years they would be right. reviewed. Yeah. So what you're saying is that could be, I mean, I hope that's okay, convener, but should, should that right to have it reviewed, should there, is there conditionality on that? Should you have the right to have it reviewed every, and I'm not, I'm not being troubled, I just don't understand it, yeah. every three months, every six months, every nine months, when should the person who is residing under that level of security and mm -hmm. detention have the right to have the review, have it reviewed or, or appeal it. Is it a standing right or is it every so often? And apologies, I won't ask any more questions. I have to get, increase my knowledge and understanding of the, of the process. Okay. Martin's going to help us all. 
hope so. Um, <laughs> I, my understanding is that the responsible medical officer, so the consultant psychiatrist, has a duty to constantly review the care and treatment of anybody on a compulsory treatment order. Uh, and that would, I think my understanding is correct, that would then enable if someone was beginning to recover and could be functioning out in a, a, an open ward, maybe not quite ready for the community, but can be not, they don't need to be in a low secure unit, so they can have ground access, they can get out and about. That would be um, for a matter a matter for the responsible medical officer to to look at, along with the, the, the treatment team and hopefully the carer and, and the service user itself. But I think it's when, uh, if, if somebody's on it for two years, then there is a statutory duty for the tribunal to review it. But in between that, because it's if you, if someone's given an order for up to, it's up to six months, the initial circumstances pending ongoing review. And I think it will be the same for low secure units. I don't know if I've helped muddied it or confused. Mm. It's my responsibility but, to get more knowledge on it. Thank you for assisting me. I, that. I suppose yeah. the other thing that I heard that people could find themselves in various types of accommodation, not because it's appropriate, but because there is there are it's lack of appropriate accommodation somewhere else. And it's whether whether in that situation I would like some clarity the, where the rights lie in that situation. You know, we've heard that you could find yourself in the state hospital and you know, and lose and, and appeal, and then lose a, you know an appropriate place somewhere else. The consequence of that would be, would be a continuing stay in the state hospital because there was nowhere for you to go. So, you know, in, in that situation, what happens, or indeed as it flows down into medium security or low security, or whether you're in the community or not, uh, you know, for me, that's what I heard. And I do know what you know the time scales. And the regular assessments don't, you know, how 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 do they come into play in those situations, uh, in order to um, ensure that people are in the appropriate setting, um, you know, based on uh, their 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 needs and their clinical assessment. Yes, Ka. I think that's where we would certainly be advocating for greater involvement of the family and carers in the review processes in assessments, not just named persons, because named persons can be different <coughs> from a, a carer. Um, because very often what might happen, or very often what could happen is that someone is deemed ready for discharge from a, a unit, maybe not the state hospital or a medium secure unit, but a low secure unit or an open ward, but the family ha are not ready. And they, but that person is still discharged into a family that are not prepared, that haven't been involved, that don't know the side effects of medication, who to call a, a crisis, all of those kind of things. And I think to try and prevent some of the issues that you're talking about, greater involvement of the family and particularly greater involvement of forensic carers of the people who are in the state hospital, because it covers the whole of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, and a lot of forensic carers feel that they are very misrepresented, that they are underrepresented, that they're not brought into any discussions about movements, etc, etc. Um, and I think greater involvement of them could help reduce problems of people being moved about and then suddenly finding you've got nowhere to go. Anyone else want to respond to any of that? Can I just comment on, on the point that Richard yes, Simpson made. Yes, because that's the one we're going to get to now, so you can kick that off. Okay, that right. Um, I think before the Mental Health Act was implemented, there were lots and lots of situations where people were told advocacy isn't suitable for you, or we don't think that... And, and quite often it was a clinical team who made a decision, and I know that, that Steve's probably got lots and lots of examples. Um, we so, But... Unfortunately, we still hear about situations where people are told advocacy isn't appropriate for you. And as a former advocate, I, I've got lots and lots of situations where I was told that the advocacy wasn't helpful because it was putting ideas in people's heads, that this person would never, ever have thought about challenging um, people in authority if you hadn't put that idea in their head. And for me, advocacy is all about broadening people's horizons, telling them about their options, telling them about their rights, all of the things that they don't know about or don't know that they can exercise those rights. So, But still, unfortunately, 
We still hear about situations where people with dementia, people with learning disabilities, children and young people who, who are part of our gaps. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to see the briefing and the information that we sent out. So children and young people who are detained under the Mental Health Act or who, who are receiving care under the Mental Health Act still don't have access to advocacy in the same way that adults do. But yes, there are still people who are told all the time that... Um, you, you don't need advocacy or actually it's inappropriate because it's going to interfere with the clinical treatment that somebody's receiving. Second, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Just, just to give it again. The care point of view. I think the other side from what she's been saying is there have been carers who have been told, well, no, because the patient doesn't need an advocacy worker because they've got a solicitor. And I'm sorry, but a solicitor and an advocacy worker do very different jobs. And the advocacy worker can actually get a lot of information from the service user because they're not coming in suited and booted from a law firm, basically. Um, so there are, and there are still, and there are carers who are also um, denied access to um, to advocacy as well. Gordon, you want, sorry. Just, just to add to that, I wanted to say that. So, uh, equally, we're told that people don't need advocacy if they've got a learning disability. But quite often, I was told that I didn't need to advocate for people who were informed about their rights. And so, there's a misunderstanding about the role of advocacy. So, it could be that sometimes I was in meetings and played a really, really active role and supported the person to speak up or spoke up on their behalf if that was what was agreed. But sometimes I was just there as a moral support because we all know what it feels like to be isolated and be on your own and so the role of the advocate will be different in different situations and they'll have a different role with different groups of people so th there's that misunderstanding amongst some some clinical teams some professionals about what advocates do and Karen's point about getting that confused about well if somebody's got a carer they do, or a named person they don't need advocacy and if they've got a lawyer they don't need advocacy but actually the, the advocate is more likely to know that person better than their lawyer. The lawyer will only see them at certain points of, 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 of their journey, but the advocate sees them a lot more often and has got a much, much better kind of qualitative re relationship with the person. Gordon, and just to give people notice, so we're in the last 10 minutes of this session. That very, very quick, and I'm also a former advocate, so I'm biased. I think a large part of, as well, people's experience of receiving compulsory treatment is disempowerment, and I think that has real implications for outcomes in terms of treatment. And I think, therefore, the value of the advocacy process has a therapeutic benefit in terms of involvement. I don't mean that in a wishy-washy way. I mean the very fact that you're giving people compulsory treatment damages them quite often and I think you know in order to kind of minimize that collateral damage if you like of that I think in advocacy should be viewed as kind of almost essential. Rhoda Grant. Um, can I, can I the yes I was hoping you would just to, <laughs> because we've, we've got 10 minutes now so I just want to ensure that you know other issues that were given an air and put on Yeah there. I mean Thanks, some people have, some people have referred to it by the name person um, I, I suppose what I'm picking up from people is um, the carer is maybe not an appropriate named person because they don't have the expertise and um, we've also heard from service users that the named person has a lot of access to their medical records and the like which is something you wouldn't maybe want a family member to have is there a need to have and I, I suppose it's up to the individual but a named person who's a professional and then extend a role to carers and family members so that they are at least equipped to support and help but maybe don't have access to the information that the person may not wish them to have. Do we do we need to expand that um, and also give people choices not to have a named person at all? A couple of bids. Um, so Karen, um, um, Caroline, Gordon, Shabine. Please. I think where a person, I think that the, the responsibility has to lie with the service user, um, giving them the, the power to decide if they want a named person. Uh, and it's one of the things that we would like to see in the new bill is that it is up to the service user whether they want to have a named person and who that named person is going to be. Where the, the service user lacks capacity or is unable to nominate um, simply because they don't have anybody in their life, then possibly a paid worker could 
come in as, as a named person. I suppose from, from our point of view, from carers' point of view, who go on to become named persons, named person has a, has a party to the hearing, so therefore they have the right to cross-examine witnesses, to lead evidence, to present evidence, etc. And we would not like that to be diminished, because for a lot of carers who take on that role, it's a powerful role that they can put their side forward. But they can also not just put their side forward, they can challenge the medical um, and mental health officer as well. Um, as far as getting what we would like to see removed from the bill is the default named person position. That is, I, I don't think I've met any service users or carers who like that idea uh, because that you can get to a stage where it's, it's anti genie five times removed living in Australia who's your nearest relative who hasn't seen you since you were two years old and you're now an adult under compulsory treatment order, what kind of information are they going to be able to realistically provide? But also, we do know from carers who were nominated as named persons when the patient was ill. Now, the point is you can't, you're not supposed to nominate at a time of illness. You, you do that when you're well. But the first that the named person knew about it was when a whole load of paperwork arrived on their door. And that's very, very sensitive paperwork. So I think there is, there's an issue there about what kind of information do we give to named persons. And again, that goes back to how do we prepare named persons to receive. And I've certainly, within my role, done some training with carers about here's the type of information you're likely to get. And it has opened, uh, Gordon was at the training, it has opened a lot of eyes that they didn't realise because some mental health officers will give you from birth to current day and others will give you just what you need to know for the for the um, purposes of the hearing. So I think it's I think it could be expanded to include paid uh, named persons, but I would be very, very careful about going down that road too much. Because I think carers, family and friends who can be named persons um, have a lot of value and a lot to offer. And I would be a bit wary if it was a paid person who was really just, oh, we'll set up a wee business and that's what we'll provide as named person are us, um, rather than a paid personal assistant, for instance, who may know the person really, really well. Caroline? We think the role of the named person is really fundamental, um, but we think that people ought to be able to choose who their named person should be. Um, the, the current bill... Um, makes a lot of improvement to named persons. You can now say you don't want one at all, and um, you can choose who you want to have. So there's, it's, it's improving the situation, but you still have the default role, the default named person, if you don't make a statement saying you don't want one at all. And the problem with that is that everything we know about people's experience of the Mental Health Act is that they're, they don't have a good awareness of their rights. The research that we did in terms of preparing our response to, to the bill um, back that up. People had a very low awareness of what their rights were. Mental Welfare Commission research has found that people are not well aware of their rights and therefore introducing a right to opt out of having a named person is not that helpful because there's no reason to think people will be any more aware of that right than they are of any other. So we agree with McManus um, who recommended the role of default named person should be abolished, that um, carers should be given some limited automatic rights to make sure that abolishing the default named person role doesn't reduce the amount of carer involvement that exists, which is really important. Um, and that named persons ought to be given more support to make sure they understand the role. Um, the, the bill that we currently have does mean that named persons will have to consent to taking on the role, which we think is good. It should mean they have the role explained to them. But we think named persons need more support to make sure they can carry out their role. And we're absolutely clear that the role of default named person um, should be abolished. Gordon and then Shubin. Two very quick points. I agree with a large amount of that, but to, to point out as well that I don't think there's any real training or support, apart from the stuff Karen does, for named persons that I'm aware of. So you can be thrown into a situation where you're expected to be effective in a tribunal process dealing with complex medical treatments about a person you love and are in a relationship with. And I think that's an impossible situation for a lot of people. Um, I also think as well the alternative about no disrespect to say an MHO, they'll, be, they'll know the press systems and the process very well, but they will not know the person. And I think you really, again, go back to my echoing my point about freeing up capacity to do proactive work with people. We would agree that the default name position needs to be 
taken away. And I think that the point that I wanted to raise in, in support of Karen's point was that there needs to be proper support for named persons. And we've put in our evidence that named persons need to have access to advocacy because if they've got the right kind of support, they, they're going to have a better understanding of, of their responsibilities and be able to be more effective and try to, to mitigate against some of the, the issues that come up in terms of the breakdown of, of the relationship, whether it's a spouse or a partner or whatever that has come about when people have acted as a named person. And so we think that there needs to be better scrutiny of, of access to, as Karen's point about access to, to advocacy for carers is very, very limited. We, our evidence shows that and backs that up. And so we think that there needs to be something about maybe some the Mental Welfare Commission has some sort of responsibility at looking at who can and can't access advocacy and, and how that access happens right across the country. Because our main concern is that the Section 259, the implementation around access to advocacy, isn't happening in a coherent and consistent way across the country. So we think that the, the that would would help to address some of the gaps because we'd be able to find out who isn't getting access to advocacy apart from the work that the SIA does. For example, people who are detained, who, who use mental health services within the prison service up until recently, until the, the changeover to, to the NHS taking responsibility for health within the prison service, there was, very lit there was no advocacy at all for people who were detained there. Um, and slowly but surely we're, we're getting more and more access to advocacy within the prison service, but that's far from, from meeting the demand. There's, there's lots of people within the prison service who are detained under the Mental Health Act who still don't have access to advocacy. Well, that, that I'm afraid, at this point, takes us to the end of our session. Can I thank you all very much for the your attendance here this morning, the oral evidence that you have provided, and of course the important uh, written evidence that we, we have, uh, which hopefully you will see reflected in our, our reports and conclusions. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, agenda item, I don't expect to have any uh, uh, bother with the committee members about this, but uh, agenda item number nine is deferred until the 25th of November, unless I've got any committee members who want to push on for another. <laughs> Thank you all very much. The meeting is now closed. Thank you. Thank you.